Hello, good morning, and welcome to the Bank on Washington 2021 Virtual Forum. We're so excited to spend the next two mornings with you as we dive into the theme of FinTech and how it intersects with our Bank on Washington work. We are so glad that you're joining us here today. As we begin, I want to start our time together by acknowledging that we are all on land that was stolen from Native people the first people of the region. Because we're all together today virtually on different lands, I will talk about the land where I'm at right now in Renton. The land where I live is at the intersection of the traditional land of the Muckleshoot and Duwamish people. I want to honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who were its first inhabitants. I also want to recognize the ways that colonization and genocide have caused displacement and harm to their communities, past and present. Please pause with me. Looking to the future, I would encourage us to look for ways to repair the harm that has been done. I have a few thoughts about how we might do that. For those of you who would like to learn more about the Duwamish or Muckleshoot tribes, there are links in the programs in the program to their website. The Duwamish are not a federally recognized tribe. There is work being done to rectify that and you can sign on in support. And there is a tangible way that you can support the Duwamish people through the Real Rent Duwamish site. I encourage you to check it out and consider what support you can provide. October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, which is an issue that is close to my heart. I've included information about the pandemic of missing and murdered Indigenous women here locally and across the US, including a link to a TED Talk by local athlete and Cowlitz and Muckleshoot tribal member Rosalie Fish. There is work happening locally in Washington around supporting Indigenous individuals, families, and communities. One of the organizations working with Indigenous entrepreneurs is Tribal Technology Training. We'll hear from the founder and executive director, Andrea Alexander, tomorrow morning. If you do not know on whose land you live or work, please take a moment to do some research. The Native Land app is available for Android and iPhones and can provide you that information. Reach out to the Indigenous people living and working in your community or region. And last, if you'd like more information about why we pause to acknowledge the land we're on, there's an excellent link in the program with more information. Thank you. My name is Jennifer Quiroz and I'm the Executive Director of the Financial Empowerment Network. I am so excited to be here in this role. I just started in July, so it's nice to meet you all. I know that there are some of you who I have not yet had the chance to meet individually, and I would love to do so. So please feel free to reach out to me and let's schedule a time to connect. I would like to welcome everyone who's here attending today. First, Thank you to all of our Bank On Coalition partners. There are local Bank On initiatives across the state made up of nonprofits, financial institutions, and governmental agencies working together to do some really innovative financial empowerment and asset building work in their local communities. If you would like more information about the Bank On in your area, please check out our website, take a look at the Jamboard to see who's here, or reach out to me and I would be happy to get you connected. I would also like to welcome all of our Bank On partners who are joining us from outside of Washington State and across the country. Welcome and thanks for being here today. Thank you and welcome to all the financial institutions who have certified Bank On accounts available. We currently have 12 certified accounts in Washington State. And a special welcome to our newest Bank On partner, First Security Bank of Washington, who was just certified earlier this month. 
And I know many of our financial institution partners are in various stages of exploring or obtaining the bank on certification. And I want to welcome all of our bank and credit union partners. Thank you for being here. We're so glad you're joining us today. Welcome and thank you to our sponsors. We appreciate your support of Bank on Washington and the Financial Empo Empowerment Network. Thank you for your help in making this event happen and in all of the ways that you've contributed to the forum today. Thank you. I want to take a moment to talk about Bank on and what brings all of us here today. I know many of you are familiar with this, but I don't want to assume that everyone knows about the Bank on movement. So what is Bank On? Bank On is a national movement to increase access to safe and affordable accounts. Lacking access to an account at a bank or credit union, credit union can be very expensive. On average, a person who is unbanked will spend $40,000 over their lifetime on financial services fees. Folks who are unbanked are also less likely to increase savings and establish a new credit score. In a study done by the CFE Fund, the effects of getting banked were clear. Folks were eight times more likely to increase their savings relative to those who did not get an account during their time in financial counseling. At its heart, we are here today to talk about financial services that can help protect people's money and help people save their money. There are bank on coalitions across the US, including many here in Washington state. Bank on Seattle King County was actually the second bank on initiative in the country. So we have some very deep roots in this work here in our state. Thank you to all of you who have worked to ensure that bank on is a strong and vibrant movement here so that Washingtonians have access to safe and affordable accounts throughout the state and in their own communities. Bank on is a collaborative effort. It really takes the participation of folks from across sectors to have a successful coalition. We need financial institutions at the table, willing and able to be creative problem solvers in getting folks connected to accounts. We need community organizations who have trusted relationships with the individuals and communities who are in need of safe and affordable financial services. They also have their finger on the pulse of what communities are asking and needing from us. Local government helps drive this movement with its broad reach and audience. And federal regulators help us ensure we can meet regulatory needs or update when necessary to meet the identified needs in each community. We hosted a coalition building learning series earlier this year in May and June that really dove into exploring what makes powerful coalitions. The four videos are available on our YouTube channel and are linked in the program if you would like to take a look. And I will also drop them in, drop the link in the chat here. For our banking industry partners, the national account standards offer a level playing field. There is one set of standards across the country that financial institutions must meet to obtain certification and be recognized. In the past, there's been a patchwork of standards that were confusing and felt somewhat arbitrary, but now we have one clear set of standards. These standards were created with consumers in mind to ensure that the accounts are safe, affordable, and functional for the folks we are hoping to reach. They offer maximum benefit to consumers who may have limited or challenging history with banking. For example, there's a requirement that there not be overdraft or uh, non-sufficient fund fees. And that's helpful for consumers who may not be in the habit of regularly checking their balances quite yet. It also offers protection for banks. The folks won't be able to get in over their heads and rack up debt that they won't be able to repay. These accounts are meant as a tool to help folks build, learn, and gain confidence in both themselves and in banking systems. This one set of standards also provides clarity for our community partners and consumers to have a solid understanding of what the accounts offer. 
The full standards are linked in the program for you to take a look and learn more about what they entail. Bank on certification offers benefits to financial institutions as well. There are opportunities for recognition on a statewide level, as well as in your local community. You will receive this seal to use in your marketing, which identifies you as having a bank on account. You're added to our Bank on Washington website, and we help connect you to local partners. In addition, you are helping bring new customers into the financial mainstream, new banking customers. And if you're serving folks well, you'll build a sustainable customer base that will grow. And last, what we have heard from many partners is that offering these bank on products is helpful for your CRA examinations as well. And the great news about bank on is that it is successful. This data is from 2019. That year, over 1.9 million bank on accounts were opened across 10 of the participating financial institutions. There's often a fear that the accounts will get opened and either sit dormant or get drained and closed again. However, the data tells us that this largely is not true. There were an average of 38 million debit transactions per month worth an average of $1.25 billion in 2019. That's a lot of movement. And this middle statistic is really exciting. 85% of accounts that were opened in 2019 were customers who were new to that financial institution. So we don't have a way to know if they were totally unbanked or if they were coming from another financial institution, but it shows the benefit to offering these highly sought after bank on accounts. So here we are today. We have folks from across Washington state and beyond and folks representing many different sectors, nonprofits, financial institutions, government, and regulators. And we're here to talk about FinTech. What is FinTech and why are we talking about it in relationship with BankOn? Like I said at the beginning, our goal is to talk about financial services that help folks protect and save their money. Another way to say that might be healthy financial products and services. FinTech is admittedly a blurry landscape. It is still emerging and many of us, regulators included, are struggling to catch up. But at the core, it is a new iteration of a financial services system that has continued to evolve and will continue to evolve. It's the shiny new thing, so we wanna be here to dig in. Our goal over these two days is to explore various iterations of FinTech, some from inside of traditional financial services and some outside. We will learn more about what some of those mo new models and FinTech solutions look like. We want to give you tools to understand the landscape a bit more and to be able to talk with consumers. Our goal is never to tell folks what to do or what companies to use, but rather to educate, to provide information, and to help them to make better informed decisions and understand how to navigate this new terrain. We plan to explore research on the topic of FinTech, specifically around how it can either cause harm or be leveraged to increase financial inclusion and improve financial wellness of individuals and communities who have been historically marginalized and excluded. What are the concerns around FinTech? What are the considerations we need to be thinking about as we continue to evolve and move forward? And what is the potential in FinTech? While we may not be able to answer every question over the next two days, our goal is to spark conversations. We hope you will engage with us and with each other throughout the next two days as we delve into these questions and more. So a few logistics to get us through the next couple of days. The program for the forum is available on the Bank on Washington website. I will drop the link in the chat so you have the direct link available. 
In that program, you'll find lots of information about the forum, including speaker bios, contact information, and lots of resources. Also, the program is where you'll find our schedule for each day. We will have breaks. There will be two each day, so take a look at the agenda for the timing of those breaks. We hope to start each session promptly, so make sure you get back from break, grabbing your coffee or tea or water so you don't miss any of the action. Please know that this forum is being recorded and the recordings and materials will be available in the next week or so on the Bank on Washington website. You can check back there and once they are ready, you will also get an email with links for where to find everything. If you have any technical difficulties during the forum, please reach out to me directly, jennifer at benoit.org. I'll put that in the chat as well. And we want you to be part of the conversation. In an attempt to make this virtual forum feel a little bit more interactive, we will be using Google Jamboard over the next two days. It's a virtual whiteboard. There are links to instructions and a short 90 second video on how to use it in your program, as well as the link to get there, which I will also add in the chat right now. Please head over there and on the first page, you can let us know how are you feeling this morning? What energy are you bringing to the forum today? Or what are you hoping to get out of the next two days together? On the third page, you'll also find a place to drop your virtual business card. Please share your name, pronouns, organization, and contact information there. And there's also a map for you to mark where you are joining us from today. We're excited to see where folks are coming from, from Washington State and beyond. If you prefer to stay here in Spondulix, you can do that as well. If that's easier, you're welcome to use the chat feature here in Spondulix. We'll be monitoring that throughout the forum. So feel free to use that if it's easier. And last, you can always join us on Facebook. We've been sharing lots of great content over the last few weeks and uh, we'll be a place that will continue this conversation once the forum is over. So be sure to follow us on Facebook. I would like to introduce you to our moderators. We have four moderators who will be leading us through the forum over the next two days. Thank you so much to Ryan Davis, Becky House, Jared Shapiro, and Kathy Winnegar. Ryan Davis is the chair of the Skagit Asset Building Coalition and the Asset Building Coordinator for Community Action of Skagit County. Becky House is the Director of Strategic Initiatives at American Financial Solutions and serves on the board of the Financial Empowerment Network. She has over 25 years of experience in training and education development in nonprofit organizations. And she is also a Bank on Washington co-chair. Jared Shapiro is a college and community navigator with Workforce Snohomish. He leads the Snohomish County Asset Building Coalition and has over 10 years experience working with low income and marginalized populations. The three of them will be helping keep us on time and on track during the forum. So thank you very much to the three of you. Kathy Winnegar will be our Jamboard host and moderator helping to bring the conversations happening there to the presenters and moderators. So please make sure you join Kathy on Jamboard. Kathy is the Community Relations Liaison and Special Projects Director at Washington Trust Bank. She serves as a gubernatorial appointee of the Financial Education Public-Private Partnership and is also co-chair of Bank on Spokane. Thank you to all four of you for bringing your expertise today and for helping to facilitate these conversations. I appreciate, I appreciate you all very much. Once again, here are the links to both of the websites. Bankonwashington.org is where you'll find information about the forum. And we wanted to share as well the Financial Empowerment Network's website everyoneiswelcome.org. There's lots of information and resources there as well as um, upcoming events and uh, other resource information. So check those out. Thank you again to all of you who are joining us here today, all of our attendees, and welcome to the 2021 Bank on Washington Forum. With that, I'd like to turn it over to John Kim, the Financial Empowerment Network Board President. Thank you so much, John.
Thank you, Jennifer, and good morning to you all. I am honored to be welcoming you on behalf of the Financial Empowerment Network, where our mission is to advance financial empowerment through partnerships that support access to affordable, effective, and relevant services, products, and other resources. One of the ways that we give life to our mission is to host Bank on Washington's annual forum. So welcome to the 2021 Bank on Washington annual forum. We are facing monstrous wealth inequity and current circumstances only serve to exacerbate the gulf between the uber wealthy and those who live in poverty. Time and time again, we see that the health and wellness of a community depends on the health and wellness of each person in that community. Can financial institutions play a key role in providing the education and services to ensure that all of us have access to the tools we need to be truly empowered? Will more step up to offer certified accounts that meet bank on standards and serve the needs of the underbanked? Will the advent of FinTech serve to reduce disparities in ability to achieve financial empowerment, or will it only create further divides? We shall see. For those of you who were with us in previous years, welcome back. It's good to see you. And for those of you joining for the first time, buckle up. We've got a lot of great content for you coming in the next few days. And so, Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce a very special guest, our very own state treasurer, Mike Pellicciotti, to officially kick us off. Please take the stage. Hey everyone, again, my name is Mike Pellicciotti. I am your Washington State Treasurer, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the Banked on Washington Virtual Forum uh, for this year. Um, over the next couple of days, you're gonna be dealing with some of the most critical issues uh, facing uh, access to economic uh, mobility uh, in our state. And I just really appreciate all the work you do. I am particularly proud that the Washington State Treasurer's Office was one of the founding members uh, of this effort and uh, also pleased and, and proud to have uh, Brenda Snyder uh, from our office serving as a co-chair uh, this year as you do the important work and move forward, especially over the next couple of days in really advancing uh, the issues that, that you'll be addressing. Um, you know, so much of access to uh, economic mobility um, is, is critical, not just for the opportunities that it provides, but I really uh, truly believe uh, that the future of our uh, economic systems is only uh, as, as sound as uh, its confidence of the people and their participation in it. Um, you know, that's why your work is really making a difference. Uh, the, the more People can be empowered, feel uh, comfortable entering into a bank, um, understanding um, the opportunities for financial empowerment and the opportunities to, for uh, financial and upward uh, mobility. Um, the, the more people will uh, buy into um, our, our important and, and well-organized economic uh, systems that have served uh, very well for, for many years here in our state and in our country. And so, um, you know, one of the things that I particularly appreciate is how so many of you um, are really committed uh, to giving a voice and really finding ways to uh, listen to each other and better connect uh, all of Washingtonians um, for, to uh, have access to our banking systems and benefit uh, from the, the security and structure uh, that that provides. Uh, so, you know, as you go ahead in the next couple of days, no pressure, uh, it's certainly uh, important work uh, but it's never been more critical and the work that you do has never been more important and i'm just so proud uh, of the washington state treasurer's office involvement in this program um, and certainly our particular commitment to it since its founding uh, so with that i want to welcome you again uh, to the banked on washington virtual forum and just share with you again uh, how much i appreciate the important work that you're doing and i look forward to the continued partnership of our office uh, with uh, the efforts as you move ahead. So again, uh, welcome, and I look forward to working with you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here today, and we hope that you find this forum um, 
interesting and enlightening and interactive. We want to make sure that everybody got to hear about the tools that are available to communicate because we want this to be as interactive as possible. Um, and you know, throughout this entire this entire forum, we really want to have that back and forth if we can if we can achieve that. That's our goal. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jared to get us started talking about some of those tools. Hi, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Becky. Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate uh, some of what Jennifer talked about, specifically around where you can find great information about the forum, um, the agenda, lots of great links to web content from each of the presenters, information about the Financial Education Network, or Financial Empowerment Network, rather. Um, what else? You're going to find lots of great content about fintech, um, different workshops and trainings, how to get connected to bank on accounts, lots of great information there. Um, you can find it amongst other places on the Bank on Washington website. I'm also going to drop the link in the chat. So you might want to have that as a tab up in your browser um, to pull that up and flip through if you if you want to supplement what you're seeing on screen. So good morning, everyone, and welcome and excited to be part of the forum today. Thanks, Jared. Uh, while you're looking at the links in the chat, I want to call your attention to the chat. The, uh, the chat in Spondulix is a great way to get connected with each other and to send us your thoughts and questions as the day goes by. Every time you see us, that means that we're getting close to a break or we're coming out of a break. So that might be a great time to share your thoughts or to throw a little bit of uh, excitement into the chat. Just to make sure that everyone is using it and to have a little bit of practice, I'm going to send you a challenge in the chat please tell me about the last time that you used a financial technology. And I'm leaving that question intentionally vague. I'm looking forward to connecting with everybody today, looking forward to hearing from our speakers. And most importantly, I think I'm excited to see what happens in Jamboard. Kathy, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, definitely. Head on over to Jamboard. It is in the links in all of the chat sections, and we are excited to hear from you virtually today. So. I'll be there. I'll be hosting that. And I've enjoyed some of your comments already this morning. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kathy. And thank you to Wells Fargo, our innovator sponsor for the Bank on Washington 2021 Forum. Wells Fargo has been a longtime Bank on supporter and supporter for many years, uh, a partner for many years. We appreciate your support of the Bank on Initiative and the work of the Financial Empowerment Network. If you're interested in learning more about the Wells Fargo Bank on Certified Account, check out the Bank on Washington account website, bankonwashington.org forward slash accounts. And there you will find a link to their clear access banking accounts. So thank you again to Wells Fargo for your generous support of this year's Bank on Forum. With that, we're excited to kick things off with our opening plenary. Uh, this will be a fireside chat with Morgan Housel, facilitated by Adam Stein. Becky, could you do me the honors of introducing Adam and Morgan? Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, so our first ch chat here, Morgan Housel is a partner at the Collaborative Fund and a former columnist at Motley Fool and the Wall Street Journal. He's a two-time winner of the Best in Business Award from the Society of American Business Editors and Writers, winner of the New York Times Sydney Award, and a two-time finalist for the Gerald Loeb Award for Distinguished Business and Financial Journalism. His book, The Psychology of Money, is not available. Uh, is not available. It is available. Morgan it is now been, available. <laughs> it is now available. I think it's supposed to say, yeah, definitely. It is available because I was just looking at it. Um, <laughs> Uh, he's presented at more than 100 different conferences in dozens of countries, and he speaks about behavioral finance and history using storytelling to explain how investors deal with risk and how we can think about risk in a more productive way. Our host today is Adam Stein, a compliance manager and CRA officer at Columbia Bank, overseeing regulations that ensure financial institutions do their share in the communities they're a part of. Adam's been in banking for over 15 years, working previously at Umqua Bank and the former West Coast Bank. Before beginning his career in banking, he served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Mongolia from 2004 to 2006 as a community and economic development advisor, supporting Mercy Corps Gobi Initiative. Adam is also a big supporter of the Bank On Initiative and Asset Building Networks, serving in an advisory role for a number of coalitions throughout the Pacific Northwest. 
In his free time, Adam likes to pursue long-term investing strategies that lead to compound growth, which sounds pretty exciting. Um, thank you both for being here today. And I do want to say, I watched a couple of videos with um, Morgan over the last few days, and he is a very um, energetic, enigmatic speaker. So I'm pretty excited for this talk today. Adam, take No pressure. Away. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. Uh, Morgan, I was going to ask uh, just initially, uh, how many languages is your book in now? Uh, thanks. Thanks. Ed. I, I, I'm going to start real quick and say the irony is I live in Sammamish. I'm, I'm local to Washington, but I'm coming to you from a hotel in Minneapolis. So this is just, this explains the craziness of where, 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 where COVID has, has led us to, but um, really happy to be here. The book is in 42 languages. Now, if you asked me a year ago, can I name 42 languages? I would have said no. And I probably could have gotten to about 15 or 20. So I've learned a lot about languages just by how many languages the book has been translated into. Lots of them are different, uh, different Indian in dialects and whatnot, but it's in, it's in 42 languages now. That's amazing. Uh, by the way, too, uh, I just want to highlight uh, for a fireside chat, I do have a uh, fireplace behind us. So uh, I feel like hopefully that uh, helps give us a little flavor for our, our chat uh, this next hour. Um, yeah, I'm just excited to be here more than anything, Morgan. I, I've really enjoyed uh, reading your book, um, also seeing some of the content you've put out. Uh, I think it is. Becky was noting, it's just, uh, you, know, you have just a great perspective, uh, in, in my opinion. Um, uh, and yeah, and just thinking through some of these things, uh, would love to just initially start with, you know, what inspired you to, to write the, uh, your book, The Psychology of Money? Well, thanks. I, it, you know, to, to, to take you back a little bit, I started my career as a financial writer in 2008 which was a really interesting time to start as a writer because the world was falling to pieces. Everything was breaking. The, the, the whole global economy was collapsing. And so I spent my first years, two or three years as a writer, trying to answer the question, why did people do what they did during the housing bubble of the 2000s and during the financial crisis? Just what happened? I just wanted to answer the question, what happened? And I realized as the years went on that you could not answer that question through the lens of economics. Or finance. If you're just looking at an economics textbook, it does not explain why people did the things that they did during the housing bubble and during the collapse. But you could find subtle clues to that answer. If you're looking through the lens of psychology and sociology and politics and history and all these other fields that had nothing to do with finance could explain why people made these financial decisions. That to me just kind of opened up this idea that investing and money is not the study of finance. It's a study of how people behave with money and behavior is such a big, broad field, like all kinds of things, whether it's health or politics or like the, the, all those fall under the umbrella of how do people make decisions around greed and fear and opportunity, which is what money is. And so once I brought in the horizons of writing about money beyond economics and finance, I just, it became so much more interesting to me to spend all my time reading about psychology and sociology and history and applying those insights, those stories into finance. Um, in 2018, I wrote a very long blog post called The Psychology of Money. It's almost 10,000 words long, which is very long for a blog post. And I just wanted to lay out what are the 20 biggest ideas that I've come across over a decade of writing about the psychology of money and just laid them out there. And the post did very well. Over a million people read it. And I thought, okay, there's something here. If, if I can explain how people think about money and do it through the lens of other fields that makes it kind of exciting and a little bit quirky – that's that's a good way to explain it to people, and this is a this is important because so much of financial education um, is is done through the lens of academic finance. So it's here's a big hairy formula, here's a bunch of data, here are a bunch of acronyms, and to your average person, or not even the average person, even to someone who has financial sophistication, that could be a turnoff because it's not very exciting. It feels like you're back in school or it's intimidating. But if I can explain finance to you through the lens of a story about World War II or a story about ice ages, then I think you kind of broaden the lens of people saying, oh, this is actually a little bit interesting to me. I'd like to read about this. That's where the book idea came from. Yeah, no, that's, um, oh, I appreciate that so much. And you know, when when I think about uh, just, um, yeah, the, the lessons, you know, these 20 ideas that you write about, which, by the way, I, I appreciate how in the beginning of, beginning of your book, uh, you said you wanted to keep it short because uh, <laughs> keep people's attention and that you feel like, right, like, um, yeah, 
uh, people, uh, if you can't, uh, if you can't fit into 200 uh, pages, what you want to say that, well, you know, you might not really keep people's attention. Um, That's right. Uh, yeah, in your book, uh, you talk about people who don't have uh, much access to resources uh, and, and yet still are able to retire or, or grow wealth uh, um, uh, yeah, that, uh, you know, would seem to be beyond their means. Um, you know, what would you say are some of the most critical behaviors uh, that led to those successful results? Yeah, so there's this great quote that I love from Napoleon, who was once asked, what is the definition of a military genius? And Napoleon said, a military genius is the man who can do the average thing when everyone else around him is losing his mind. And I love that quote because I think it applies perfectly to investing as well. That everything we know about investing is that being a good investor is not necessarily about making great decisions. It's not about, you know, timing the market or picking the best stocks. Being a great investor is overwhelmingly about just becoming average and staying average when everyone else is losing their mind. So if you can be an investor who keeps your head on straight during March of 2020, when the market is melting down, during October of 2008, when the market is melting down, if you can just be average then and keep your cool, that's, that is, that's not a little thing. That's 90% of investing success over time. It's just, can you stay in the game when everyone else is panicking? That's, that's the biggest thing. I think there's another important point here too, which is that I think there is a pyramid of financial skills and the base of that pyramid is behavior. And what I mean by that is until you have mastered your behavior, until you can keep your head on straight, until you've figured out your relationship with greed and fear, those kind of things, none of the other skills above that matter because you can be the best stock picker in the world. You can be a business genius who can pick the best stocks and understand everything. But if you if you panic when the market crashes and you sell everything, none of none of it matters. None of your accounting skills matter. None of your business identification skills make any difference whatsoever. And so until you've figured out behavior, none of the other skills above it mean anything. And what's also important is that if you have figured out behavior, if you can keep your cool, then none of the other skills above it really matter that much. If you can do behavior, like that's necessarily all you need. And so if you can be an investor who just, and this is not, this is not a recommendation, but just to put it out there, if you can dollar cost average into low cost index funds and do that consistently for 30 years, you are going to beat literally 90% of professional money managers. And that's it. You can explain how to do that to someone in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that it's easy though, because you're going to have to put up with and endure uh, and survive all of the volatility between now and then. So I think the, the financial skills that matter most are pretty simple and they're behavioral in nature. They're not analytical or numerical in nature. I hear you. That I, I've been talking a lot with my nieces and nephews of late and trying to get them to think about uh, yeah, investing as a uh, yeah, adventure into their own lives a bit more and, and uh, just trying to think about like, yeah, um, strategies to, to share with them around, uh, yeah, just making it, keeping it easy and simple um, and really more focusing on anything, the behaviors. Um, by the way, real quick too, I, I I feel like for myself, how I got comfortable with investing was just realizing that it, if, if the market goes, yeah, just yeah, hits, hits bottom or goes beyond bottom, then most likely I'm going to be worrying about other things because, right, because like that's, <laughs> uh, you know, that, Right, uh, the U.S. Yeah, that's, economy. I mean, that, that's a great point. If the market falls 90%, your stock portfolio is not your biggest worry. Your biggest worry is going to be where can I find food and penicillin and ammunition? That's what you're going to be worried about. So exactly. there is this thing of like the complete catastrophe situation is not going to make that much difference. You know, if you lived in, in Germany in 1944 and the stock market fell 100%, you did not care. You did not care about your stocks anymore. You're, you're, you cared about survival. So there is a long history of financial collapse. And in those situations, nothing's going to protect you. Gold's not going to protect you. Bitcoin's not going to protect you. It becomes survival at that point. And you're right that this is not just a little historical quirk. That's an important part of becoming comfortable with being a long-term investor. Because so many particularly new investors will think, well, what happens if everything collapses and everything falls? Well, look, is that possible? Yes, of course it's possible. It's not likely. I'm not predicting it, but it's possible. But in in the, in the most of the historical financial collapse scenarios, nothing is going to protect you and you're going to have other things to worry about. Yeah. 
Which is so sobering. But uh, back to the, um, some of the things that you're um, focusing on behaviors. One of the things I think you talk about uh, in your book is um, focusing on uh, uh, simplification uh, as one of the best ways to uh, um, increase uh, your chances to um, well, be successful. Uh, what do, what do you think people who have you know, typically lower or middle incomes, um, where do you think they would get the most bang for, for their buck when it comes to simplifying their lives? I think in finances, I, one, one thing that, that sounds a little quirky, but I've seen a lot of it too, is so many people have their finances spread between multiple institutions. And even if they are a low or middle income person, they might have three separate checking accounts and four separate brokerage accounts, five different 401ks from different employers. And once I think that is that is a level of complication that just makes it really difficult to keep tabs on things. And this is important because a lot of financial problems do not come from a lack of education or a lack of sophistication. It comes from complacency. It comes when, when your finances are out of sight, out of mind, and you just don't even know what's going on. And if you are someone who has to say, you know, five different 401ks from separate employers, you probably have no idea what's happening in any of those. It's too much to track. Now there are, you know, financial software like mint.com and whatnot that can kind of combine everything into one area, which, which is great. But one of the, the tips that I give for a lot of people, particularly who are younger, or lower income, or, you know, not financial professionals is just getting everything consolidated so that it's easy for you to track because the, 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 the single biggest point of advice that I give for people with their finances, particularly younger people or lower income people is check your bank account every single day. Log into your bank account. It takes 10 seconds and just become aware with the ins and outs, money coming in, money going out. And therefore, if you can remove complacency from your financial life, you are going to take away 90% of the problems and pitfalls that people fall for. So consolidation into, into a, a simple financial life is really key. The other thing I, I would think about here in terms of simplification is simplification of your goals. A lot of people don't, a lot of investors, I would say, don't know necessarily what game they are playing. And what I mean by that is that if you are investing in the stock market, you could be a day trader who just cares about what the market's going to do over the next day. And that's fine. I, I don't want to belittle those people. Or you can be an endowment fund that has a century long time horizon and everything in between. Now, those people are going to be playing completely different games and the information that is relevant to them is going to be completely different. And therefore, if you have not identified what game you're playing as an investor, you are likely to start taking your cues and reading the information from people who are playing a different game than you. And therefore, maybe you are a long-term investor saving for retirement. That's great. But if you are watching CNBC or reading the newspaper and they are delivering information that is only relevant to day traders, well, now you're likely to just confuse yourself or instigate behavior among yourself that's going to take you away from your goals because you don't realize that you're playing football and they're playing basketball, so to speak. So I think just identifying what game you're playing and what your time horizon is and what your goals are goes a huge way to just kind of limiting the amount of information that you take in as an investor. Yeah, I, I really liked how you put that. Uh, yeah, what uh, what game are you playing? Because uh, uh, that is, I think, so much right. That can be confusing for all of us. Hearing on the news, yeah, um, even things like uh, the the um, that um, when it came to uh, uh, oh, was it um, that game games uh, GameStop or oh, why am I GameStop? Game? Yeah, uh, and, and just like thinking about like right like. That was relevant for a limited amount of people, yet I, I would imagine. Yet it was, I mean, the news was everywhere. Yeah. I mean, um, what, one other, like, one, one other example of this is if you go back to the housing bubble in the mid 2000s, a lot of why prices were going up, particularly in Miami and Las Vegas, places like that, is because of flippers. People were going in and buying a condo and selling it the next week and making a ton of money. Now, to that flipper, Rising prices that were like totally out of whack relative to income didn't matter. It did not matter that the condo was at, was unaffordable to uh, someone who was going to hold the mortgage payment for 10 years. That didn't matter. That was not the game they're playing. The problem was when prices rose because of, because of those flippers and the long-term buyer said, hey, that's what the price, that's what I should, that's what I should pay. They started taking their cues, their information from people who were playing a different game than then. And you know, day traders buy Apple stock and long-term investors buy Apple stock. And if you don't know that some of the news and some of the, the price volatility is going to be influenced by people who are playing a different game, 
if you don't realize that and you don't know what game you're playing, you are so likely to just be influenced by people who are doing something different and have different goals than you. Yeah. Well, and something that I get at times is uh, because I have interest in somewhat in, in, in finance and things like that, um, I'll get different people coming to me saying, Adam, what are some, what are some good, what are some good picks? Like what are, what are, what are some stocks that you know that uh, we, we can invest in? And inevitably, my questions are: well, What's your time horizon? Like, what uh, you know, what level of uh, risk are you comfortable with? And, you know, among other things. And yeah, and it's and it, uh, it's it's one of those things where we're trying to understand: yeah, you know, what what um, what game is this person playing? Uh, what yeah, are there's, they? There's, there's so much in finance that we treat it like math. And in math, there's one right answer for everyone. Two plus two equals four, no matter who you are, where you're from, how old you are. Two plus two always equals four for everyone. And we, we treat finance like that. Like we want to just ask, what's the right answer? And the truth is, just like you, you, you mentioned, there's not one answer. There's a different answer for everyone. And I think a big part of personal finance is just becoming introspective of who you are mm -hmm. and what your own goals are, what your own risk tolerance is. And that might be different for me than it is for you. Even if the people who have similar incomes, similar ages can come to completely different conclusions about what's right for them. And that's totally fine. And once you move away from trying to find the right answer to just trying to find your answer, finance becomes so much easier at that point. And you stop, like I said, taking your cues from people who are doing something different than you are. Uh, yeah. Thank you. That's a, that's a great point. Um, so, uh, we're going to think about your book before we, we start getting to some other topics, if you don't mind. Uh, and then I do want to leave some time for questions from uh, yeah, um, from uh, 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 folks who are participating in, in this uh, forum. Um, but um, you know how big of big events tend to lead to uh, unpredictable outcomes. Uh, just wondering, uh, yeah, I may not have a crystal ball, but uh, um, yeah, just uh, as, as you think towards the future yourself, um, uh, I was wondering if you could give us a, a couple ideas that you've been uh, thinking about or reflecting on of late uh, that uh, yeah, unpredictable outcomes that that uh, um, uh, that the, the pandemic could lead to. Well, yeah, it, it, it's it's a great question, and I would say too to to preempt this, I would say we in the industry in the finance industry spent a decade or longer trying to answer the question, what's the biggest economic risk? That takes up 90% of the oxygen in the industry. And so we asked, was the biggest risk that interest rates would rise or that inflation would rise or that taxes would go up? And that like hundreds of thousands of smart economists and investors spent a decade, 80 hours a week trying to answer that question. And then the irony is that we now know in hindsight, what's the biggest risk to the economy was COVID, which is something that no economist was forecasting. No analyst had that in their outlook until the moment it arrived and 20 million people lost their jobs in six weeks. Mm -hmm. The biggest risk is always what you don't see coming. Carl Richards, who's a great financial advisor, he has this quote where he says, risk is what is left over when you think you have thought of everything. Mm -hmm. And I think like, if you look historically, that's always the case, that the biggest risk is what you and I or anyone else cannot even fathom because it's, just, it's this freak event out of the blue. September the 11th, Pearl Harbor, COVID, those are the things that move the needle more than anything else. And their common denominator is that they were surprises. So I think there's a long history of that. And then of course, the the obvious follow-up is, okay, so what's going to be the next surprise? And I think by definition, by definition, no one can answer that. Nobody can possibly answer that. You know, there's one, there's one kind of like quirk, and this is still a hindsight thing, but the biggest news story of the last 80 years is that a nuclear bomb has not been used in anger since 1945. And I say that because if you go back to 1945 at the end of World War II, zero people would have predicted that. And that's the biggest news story of the last 80 years is what did not happen. It's just really hard to think about things that didn't happen. But that's that's by far the, like the most important news globally is what did not happen. And then it's kind of similar as you look ahead of like what's going to be the biggest news story of the next 80 years, it's something that we cannot even fathom today. That would sound ridiculous today that if I were to come up with, with an idea of what it might be, it would sound ridiculous. It would sound Pollyannish and, and, and pessimistic. Just like if this was 2019 and you asked me what was the biggest risk and I said, there's going to be a viral pandemic that's going to kill 10 million people and shut the entire global economy down. You would sound like, you you, you would be like, just, just relax, calm down. It's not going to happen. 
that's always the case. I do think like what what are some some takeaways from COVID that could could lead to um, you know big changes in the world. I think the generation of kind of older millennials, kind of people who graduated college around 2008, my generation, I think has the highest opportunity of or the highest risk I would say of being scarred by COVID. And the reason is this. If you graduated college around 2007, 2008, you began your career as an adult in the teeth of the financial crisis when the world was falling apart. And then we had kind of a slow, tepid recovery. And then everything fell apart again last year with COVID. Once you have your entire adult life has been crash to tepid recovery to crash, that can set this kind of idea in your head that maybe that's just how the world works. And it was easy in 2008 to say, the financial crisis, well, this is a big deal, but this is a once in a century event. This is not going to happen again. But then when the economy collapses again with COVID 10 years later, that sets your this idea in your mind of maybe this is how things work. Every five or 10 years, the world breaks. And the circumstances are very different, but I think it's almost similar to the generation that lived through the Great Depression. And then once that was over, they got pushed into World War II, this equal if not greater crisis. That generation, this is well documented, went through the rest of their lives scarred in terms of their ability to take risks, their willingness to go into debt, their how conservatively they invested. It stuck with them forever. Because if you spend your early adult years just kind of marred in crisis, then you, it, it, that, that kind of sticks with you. What you experience in your early adult life tends to stick with you for a very long period of time. And so I think that's the generation that will be most affected by this. And maybe w will they be less willing to take on debt, less willing to invest? I think the answer, my, my guess is the answer to that question is yes, that it's already scarred enough people who lost their jobs, lost their savings last year. Even if we had this glorious economic rebound and market rebound over the last year, what happened in March of last year was scarring enough to a generation that I think that will stick with them for the rest of their life. I see. I can't uh, agree with you more. Uh, I, I think about my grandma and, and how growing up with her, um, you know, she lived through that. Uh, uh, she was part of that generation that lived through the Great Depression, uh, World War II. And every time we'd go out for uh, lunch or dinner, she would um, uh, have the expectation that we all would eat everything. Uh, yes. <laughs> you couldn't leave anything on your plate. Um, yes. And um, I, so it's, uh, as you said, it's, it sticks with you. Um, there, there's a big history of these things where wounds heal, but scars last. The wounds of the Great Depression of World War II healed. And even if you go into, you know, Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union, the the the, the physical scars from the world for, from the war were cleared up in 10, 20 years. But the the emotional scars of that last forever. And it's the same for financial crisis. We are well beyond the housing bubble collapse of 2008. That's done. That's history. But the scars from that will stick with people forever. And so I think COVID is, is a big area of that. Maybe in a good way, we will be more, uh, we will be reasonably paranoid and cautious about viral pandemics for the rest of our life in a way that we were probably overly complacent. Of course, we were overly complacent in 2019. And so there's a lot of these two where there are good lasting behaviors that come from that. There was not a banking crisis in the United States for like 40 years after the Great Depression. Like after you have a collapse in the 1930s, that's when you have the creation of the FDIC and all these other organizations that pretty but that put really good established customs in the banking sensor and system that prevented collapse that all changed and kind of the 80s going into the late 90s and then culminated in 2008. But there is a long history of once you go through a crisis, you kind of don't make that specific mistake again for a long time. You'll make other mistakes, but not that mistake for a long time. So I can't help myself because I, I think this is great. Uh, and it just leads me to one last question uh, around uh, thinking as we come out of the pandemic or, or hopefully uh, come come out of the pandemic soon. Um, what, what behaviors do you think folk, people should focus on? Um, yeah, uh, just, uh, yeah, or, or keep in mind, um, uh, you know, as we move forward. I think what, one thing that's really true that impacted a lot of investors in the stock market over the last year is that it's always true that the market is going to rebound faster and quicker than you imagine. It, it, that, 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 that the rebound is going to take, is going to take place much earlier than seems reasonable. And it's going to be, and it's going to happen much faster. And so if you go back to April of last year, 
the the economy was still a disaster. It was a mess, and pe- millions of people were losing their jobs. Businesses were closing, were closing, and the stock market started going straight up, 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 up. And it seems crazy. It seemed like the market was so disconnected from reality. But I think we know now, a year later, in hindsight, that basically the market was foreseeing that six months in the future the economy would start getting much better, as it did. And there's a very long history of that of the stock market kind of being six to 12 months ahead of business conditions. And that can be kind of disorienting and jarring for a lot of people. And it is probably the root of most investing mistakes is not realizing the emotional disconnect between the economy and the stock market. But that's that's really important. And I just bring this up because what was the best thing to do as an investor in hindsight? In 2008, in 2020, the best thing to do was keep your head on straight and stay the course. It's so boring, it's so basic. But find me a historical, uh, find me a historic example where that was not the case. Now there are examples of countries where their stock market collapses and their currency collapses and goes to zero, and there's nothing you could do about it. As we said earlier, there there aren't any assets that are going to protect you in that scenario if if your whole society collapses. But in the United States, find me a historic example where staying the course did not pay off over time. I just don't think you can. And even with hindsight a lot of the moves just don't make any sense in real time. It's so disconnected from what the economy is doing. So I think that has really been reiterated over the last year. It happened in 2008 and happened over the last year as well. That even during the darkest moments, when you think everything is collapsing around and the market seems so disconnected from reality, what's the best thing you can do? Just keep your head on straight and keep going. That's it. I think that's something that, yeah, though is, is it, a big challenge, especially when um, when you think about uh, the um, so we're here this uh, um, this forum. Uh, it, it's part of this uh, thing called um, Bank On, and uh, which is trying to help, especially people who, who really don't have uh, either uh, access to the financial system uh, as readily, or um, you know, just uh, um, uh, have. Well, just uh, not as many resources as you know as, as others yeah, in, in this country, and and so I think right, like I'm trying to help folks to think about um, you know what, what can they focus on uh, um, yeah um, as yeah as we move forward, and and I think um, yeah uh, when, when we think about uh, um, bank on and and um, yeah, helping fo- helping people to uh, yeah, um, uh, to become banked. Uh, yeah, I think right. Um, we might say that um, yeah, um, yeah, just uh, yeah, um, working um, working with 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 uh, yeah, um, uh, people who who you know have have their best interests in mind. Uh, yeah, just uh, yeah, it's something that yeah that they. Um, yeah, that's uh, you know, something that hopefully we can you know, we can all draw from this. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's there's two there's two subjects in life that apply to everyone, whether they like them or not, and that is health or money. It doesn't matter whether you are interested in health and money. Health and money are interested in you, and so I think there's such an imperative around those two topics. And my specialty, your specialty, what we're here for today is to talk about money and banking. And it's true that no matter what you do in life that's going to impact you and if you look at the disparities among financial resources across the social the social economic spectrum it's astounding and i think it can be easy for people like myself or yourself people who work in the industry to underestimate how many people in society do not have the financial resources the financial products the financial education that people like ourselves might take for granted and when you tie that back to this idea that money is going to impact everyone, that is impacting everyone as we speak, and yet so many people in society do not have the, the tools, the education to make these decisions, you realize how much opportunity there is just bringing basic services to people. Not Nothing crazy. We're not talking about hedge funds. We're not talking about trading options. Just the most basic services of banking and payments and saving for a rainy day is enormous. So much of what I think matters in life and is a, as a big driver of anyone's success is just how much independence they have in life. How able are they to make decisions that they want to make? How many options do they have in life versus having to do what someone else wants them to do on someone else's time horizon? And your ability to have any sort of financial independence is just, do you have savings in the bank? 
do you have enough resources beyond what you need for your immediate survival in the next week? And when you realize, when you see the numbers and the data about how many people do not have that, it's, it's astounding. And I think uh, basic financial education and basic financial tools can move the needle in terms of making people's lives better as much, if not more than basic health services can. Just you know, basic health services. I mean, by like a good diet and good exercise, and be able to see the doctor once a year. The financial equivalent of that is so lacking in society, and I really appreciate and admire organizations like Bank On that are doing their part to bring that to people. And so, when we think about Bank On and the fact that it's this national movement, right, that brings uh, nonprofits, government, and financial institutions together uh, to help uh, improve the financial stability of of unbanked and underbanked individuals, um, well, and then and, and, and their families and, um, and their communities. Where do you see the most value uh, of this coalition putting their efforts? I, I think we got a already a preview of this. Is it educating individuals and families, raising public awareness, uh, strengthening partnerships, uh, or, um, encouraging financial institutions to have accounts that align uh, to the bank on national account standards or something else? It's, it's all of the above, but, but, but let me tell you what I think is, is most appealing to me that I think is so important. There's a lot of evidence that what people learn about money early on in their life when they are a teenager or in their 20s is going to stick with them forever. And it's very hard to break those beliefs about money once they have been ingrained. That's not to say that older people cannot be taught something new about money. Of course they can, but it's much harder. And so if you can get young people in their teens and 20s into good financial habits early on when they are still kind of have mental flexibility to learn something new they're, they're still learning a baseline foundation of knowledge about how money works if you can get them before age 25 let's say that's going to move the needle the most because that's when you can teach them a good habit that they will keep with them forever and now the problem is that a lot of financial products that are targeted towards young people are Predator, are, are, are predator, predatory in some way. There's a huge spectrum of that, but you see this a lot on college campuses where they're pitching products that's like, oh, no, that's not, we know that's not the best product for them. We know they should not be day trading in, in, in Robinhood accounts and whatnot. And so I think if you, can, if you can push good financial resources and financial products and financial education onto the youngest segment of society, that's when you're going to move the needle the most. I, um. I so uh, appreciate you, uh, by the way, bringing up Robin Hood. Uh, but before we get back to that, um, uh, I, I, I do remember being on my college campus uh, um, back in my early 20s and them uh, giving us free stuff uh, uh, that uh, went along with these credit cards, which, of course, the, uh, the, um, the particulars of those credit cards really didn't come until weeks or months later, <laughs> which was so uh, unfortunate. Uh, but... Um, uh, so, um, the thing though, uh, back to, to Robin hood, uh, and, and I think many would consider, uh, the Robin hood app a bit in that, in this, uh, FinTech, uh, kind of, um, right, spectrum, um, would just love to hear, uh, this is a great way for us to segue a little bit, right. To some of the, the main theme of this, this forum, which, um, yeah, thinking about FinTech and its uh, implications for, uh, yeah, um, uh, well, people um, just uh, of all different economic means. Um, it, just uh, what, what's, what it, uh, would love to hear additionally, just some additional thoughts you might have on the Robin Hood app and what it is meant for investing. And you know, is it all bad? Or I mean, I think it, right, there's definitely some good here too, I think. I don't think it's all bad. If you look at this from the highest level, what Robin Hood did is it removed trading commissions. At the high level, that's great. You just reduce costs for consumers, particularly consumers who, for whom a $20 trading commission was a lot of money. So at the high level, great. That's awesome. And they've also, they've democratized investing to younger people. Like at the highest level, great. But I, I keep emphasizing at the highest level because if you actually dig down into what that means, removing trading commissions is really removing a speed bump from people to make lots of decisions. When, when trading used to cost $20 to buy and sell, it was hard for someone to buy and sell a hundred times a day because trading commissions would eat up your entire bankroll. Everything we know about investing though, is that that's great. If you have a speed bump between you and making irrational rash decisions, that's a good thing. Everything that we know about that. 
And so I think removing the speed bump, once you phrase it at that way, if you phrase it as as zero commission, that's positive. If you if you phrase it as removing a speed bump between you and bad behavior, then it's a little bit different. And I think, uh, you know, lots of Robinhood traders have done very well over the last year, buying and selling, buying and trading uh, bankrupt penny stock companies. Everything we know about financial history too is like, we've seen that before and you know how it ends. It ends the same way every single time. You don't know when it's going to end, whether whether that whole charade is going to end a month from now or six years from now. I don't think anyone knows. And if there is one positive of that, it's maybe it's a good thing that people will learn about the downsides of risk when they're 19 versus 48 and putting their kids through college. Like maybe that's one silver lining to it. But there was also this story last summer, and this was all in the newspapers. This is not anything that's that's private, but there was a 19-year-old who opened a Robinhood account. And I think he put $1,000 into, into his account and he was trading options. And he woke up one morning and his Robinhood account said that his account balance was negative 700,000. It turns out that that was, that was not the case. That was a UI glitch. It was just an error. He did not owe 700,000, but he thought he did. And Robinhood did not really have customer service that was responding to him. There's nothing he can do. He assumed that he just bankrupted his family and he wrote a letter saying, I screwed up on Robin Hood. I'm so sorry. I don't know what to do. And he threw himself in front of a train and killed himself. Now that is an extreme example, of course, but I think that's just an example of like, this is not a game. And I know Robin Hood wants to gamify it. They want to turn this into bells and whistles and this is a fun app and we have lots of engagement, but you can't treat people's life savings like a game particularly if they are young people who are so susceptible to the worst investing behaviors of trading and buying and selling. So I, I, I'm never going to pass moral judgment onto a company because I can confidently say that everyone at Robinhood wants to do well. They do not want to hurt people. That I, would, I would never make that claim. They are not evil people. I also do not think history will look fondly upon Robinhood. I'm pretty confident in that too. I don't know when that that historical insight will take place, whether it be that's 10 years from now. But I, I do not think that a trading platform that encourages young people to day trade is going to end well. Uh, no. So much uh, good information there. Thank you so much, Morgan. That's um, uh, um, so helpful to hear uh, those things. Uh, so yeah, getting waiting a bit more into this fintech world. Um, you know, where do you think fintech is headed? Uh, uh, I mean, I know it's very broad and we can go in, you know, in many different directions, uh, but um, just wondering, would love to get your initial thoughts on like, you know, some of the things, some of the trends you're noticing, uh, any research you're aware of uh, that's, you know, telling us about some promising practices. Here's what's, here's the two sides of fintech. One is that banking and payments and savings accounts it is a very simple industry that is ripe for disruption because most of the big players are big and clunky and uh, there's there's the, and, and it's a very profitable business as well. So that's like like the perfect example of where technology can come in and disrupt it. The other side of that is that there are, for good reasons, lots of regulations in place that kind of cement the big boys, which makes it very, very difficult to disrupt. Those are the two sides of it. Ripe for disruption, very difficult for the, for disruption. I tend to think that, A, yes, there's going to be a lots of financial innovation and lots of new companies that provide great products for people going forward, 100%. I also think that 10 years from now, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Citigroup, the, the, the big banks will still have enormous market share. That's like There are a lot of people in VC and in fintech that do not believe that's the case. I would still bet on that being the case just because the regulatory framework that keeps them embedded into the system again, for good, for good reasons is very powerful and it's easy to overlook. And so at, at the end of the day, there are a lots of things with, with banking and, and finance that banking is really just pipes and plumbing. It's just moving money around the global economy, paying your bills, getting paid. It's just a bunch of pipes that can go through. And there are technologies, people in Silicon Valley who might be able to do that better than a bank in New York city. Um, and I so think to the extent that that technology has developed and is developing, that's great. And can some of that technology be put into place at Citigroup and Wells Fargo? Just naming those off the top of my head? Yes. And should it take four days for your ACH payment to settle? No. And like, like will that change over the next decade? Yes. And so I, 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 I can just easily go both ways on fintech about 
it's it's probably the last industry that's just we're operating with 1960s technology to make payments and it's just ridiculous and that needs to change and it is changing and i'm excited about the companies that are trying to change it it's wonderful i also just think that it's a very different industry this is not like uh social media where it was just kind of a complete free-for-all do whatever you want the big boys in banking are so entrenched with regulations that it just makes it hard to move them in one direction mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's fascinating to think. Uh, I, I, um, some of my earlier jobs in banking, and, uh, even though I'm starting to get into my middle ages, uh, you know, we were still using faxes for things, and <laughs> uh, just uh, yeah, uh, as you said, uh, definitely using technology that is uh, rather clunky at times. Um, yeah. Uh, when you think about uh, the again, um, some of the lessons from your book around simplification, like is is there is there things that you think that fintech could help with when it comes to simplification? I think, you know, most to, 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 to the extent that banking can be automated, that investing can be automated to just set up, set up a process that says, I want to invest a hundred dollars a month into this portfolio and I don't want to do anything ever again. And maybe now that portfolio can, do what's called tax loss harvesting and reporting is much better. So there's there's areas where fintech can really simplify your life to where you can sit down either by yourself or with a financial advisor and say, this is what I want to do over the next 10 years and then set up a process to effectively automate that. And once you automate it, once you can take out the emotions of needing to pull a lever or turn a dial once a month or whatever it is, I think you are removing the potential to make a lot of investing mistakes, which is, which is great. Like, Everything that we know about investing is if you if if you have lots of levers to pull and dials to fiddle with, you're going to make more mistakes. Mm -hmm. And so, if you can automate those decisions, so you don't have to think about them again, that's that's wonderful. Um, you know, I think I think there's, there's just a lot in terms of financial planning software as well. In terms of, I think we've we have there are a lot of tools that can automate portfolio allocation. Which what 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 I mean by that is how much of your money should be in stocks versus bonds. There's so many tools out there, Betterment, Wealthfront, and whatnot, that can effectively automate that for you and do it for you. We have not yet been able to figure out how to automate and use technology very well for financial planning. Sitting down with someone and saying, "Okay, what is your risk tolerance? How old are you? Do you have insurance? Do you have a will?" That kind of nitty gritty financial planning is still by and large done sitting on the other side of a desk from a human being and talking to them, which is fine. That's great. But we haven't really used technology to automate that process yet. And that's a huge opportunity because most of those services right now are only for wealthy people because to sit across the table from an educated person costs a lot of money for their time. You got to pay them by the hour. If you can use technology to bring that to the masses, that's a huge opportunity and I, I, that I don't think has been cracked yet. That's such a great point. And you're right. I mean, we, I mean, everyone should have a will, right? I mean, I remember reading about that in my personal finance classes, like it doesn't matter where, where your income level is. I mean, you may have last wishes that you want uh, you know, to ensure that uh, those, those are um, uh, fulfilled um, or, you know, we all need insurance uh, in some shape or form. Um, so I really appreciate that, that perspective you have there on, you know, where, you know, you know, hopefully something, yeah, either fintech or something else will explore. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. there are there are options like legal zoom and whatnot that can try to that have tried to use technology to get this done. And I think by and large, those are those are okay. But right now, if you want to get a good will that has lots of the kind of bells and whistles that might be really important to you, you got to pay a lawyer three thousand bucks or whatever it is to sit down and do a will for you. So it is only available to kind of the wealthiest segment of society. Oh. Um. Well, a uh, couple um, uh, last questions uh, before we start getting into some Q&A. Um, uh, we'd love to hear uh, your thoughts around uh, any unintended consequences uh, that could uh, come from the emergence of fintech. I think very. I, I think Robinhood is the best example of this. Robinhood is fintech at its finest. And I mean that in, in a good way. It was two entrepreneurs that saw a broken system, that saw that investing needed to be democratized. They saw that investing products were only for wealthier people, and they wanted to bring that to the masses. I love that. That's phenomenal. The unintended consequences that we just talked about are pretty obvious, though. I think what is really hard in investing is that it's hard to make money as a business, giving people good financial advice to tell people, Hey, just own some index funds and leave them alone for 30, for 30 years and let them grow. 
you as a, as a business can't make a lot of money doing that, but you can make a lot of money getting people to trade, telling people that you need to open your app every day and make 10 trades that you can make a lot of money doing. And so there is this disconnect between what works economically for a fintech business and the advice that actually people need to hear. I think it's it's ironic or, or telling, I should say, that the only company that has really figured out how to give people good, long-term, cheap investing products, which is Vanguard, is a nonprofit company. And it's maybe like, that's the only way that you can make it work is to say, hey, we're going to give people the like really good advice. And we know we can't make any money doing that. So we're not even going to try to make money. It's a nonprofit. It's run as a mutual. And that's pretty telling that that's kind of the only way to do it or that that, that that's the big company that, ha that has been able to do it. So I think there is a big disconnect on making money, particularly if you are a VC backed company and you need to make a ton of money to pay your investors back. And the, the disconnect between that and giving people what we know to be good financial advice is where there's room for unintended consequences. So um, as we uh, close out uh, a little bit our time together and uh, before we go to some Q&A, um, you know, when just going back to your book and, and thinking about um, yeah, some of the most important lessons from it, um, uh, yeah, it seems like you know how life can be very random, um, uh, you know, which which is why we want to more focus on behavior. Um, if there was just one or a couple things uh, uh, you would um, love for people to take away from your book, uh, what would they be? One is that we are all very different people, even if we are the same age, income, nationality, generation, whatever it is. We've all seen a very different side of the world. And someone who, if, if you lived in Australia, uh, you, you did not experience a recession for 30 years. Australia went 30 years without a recession. COVID was their first recession in 30 years. So therefore, someone in Australia has a very different view about economic risk than someone in the United States. And people in the United States have a very different view about economic risk than someone living in Venezuela or Zimbabwe. Even if those people are the same education. Uh, same generations, they think about economic risk totally differently. And therefore, we should never, it's so easy to underestimate how prevalent that is. And how a lot of times in finance, when two people are debating about a topic, should you buy this stock? Is the economy strong? Like they're debating what's right. A lot of times those people are not actually debating. They're people who have different goals and are playing a different game talking over one another. So I think recognizing how different we view financial risk based off of our own unique personal histories is really important. The second I would say is realize that we are not machines. We are not spreadsheets. And therefore, we should not expect to make rational decisions all the time with our money. That sounds counterintuitive. Like, don't we want to make rational decisions? Well, ideally, yes, but we're not machines. We're emotional creatures. All of us. We're emotional, hormonal people. Every single one of us. And therefore, I think the best that you can do with your money is don't try to be coldly rational. Just try to be reasonable. Just try to make reasonable financial decisions. If you can go through your life just being pretty reasonable most of the time with your money, you'll do fine. You don't need to be coldly rational and calculate everything down to the 10th decimal point. Just try to be okay with your money and then you'll be fine. Very similar to health, where it's like you don't need to take 80 vitamins every day to be healthy. Just eat some fruits and vegetables and go for a walk and you'll probably be okay. Just try to be reasonable with it. Uh, which brings a lot of comfort to me when I think about uh, some of my choices <laughs> in my day to day. Um, so uh, I have a question, and this is from someone you know. Um, uh, he wanted me to uh, put this out there. Uh, I think uh, it sounded like uh, as a child, uh, uh, um, you had uh, a serious stutter, I believe. Uh, and um, you wrote a blog post about this explaining uh, how you overcame it and um, how that process helped you. Um, yeah. Um, uh, what, uh, you know, what, what, uh, what could you tell us around? Like, just like, what was it, what was your experience there? What, uh, how did that, um, you know, how did that shape you? Yeah. So I had, I had a, a very serious stutter in my childhood and into my teens. I could, I could barely talk to anyone except my parents until I was, um, uh, 12 or 14 years old, something like that. And even today as, as an adult, it's still, it still afflicts me. I still stutter around my wife and my parents but I've, I figured out how to overcome it over the years just by kind of changing around the order of my sentences and figuring out what sounds and words are going to trip me up and trying to avoid them on the fly in real time. 
And so it's been great that now a lot of what I do for a living is I'm a public speaker. And to go from someone who could not really talk when they were 12 years old to become a professional public speaker, that's that's been great. And there's two things that kind of come from this to, to, to try to wrap this up that I think are really powerful. One is that a lot of people did not know I stuttered because I just didn't talk that very much. And a lot of people's biggest skeletons that are just haunt them in life are invisible to people. And everyone deals with anxiety and they have their own, you know, depression is so prevalent, but a lot of times it's invisible to everyone else. So once you go through life, just realizing that a lot of people are having a bad day, but everyone's just trying to make it through the day the best that they can. I think you become more empathetic to people. The other is, like I said, if I, if you go from not being able to talk when you're 12 to being a professional speaker in your thirties, the, it's the, the gap between those two is happiness. And it's really just, it's just emphasized for me that a lot of happiness is just starting with a low base. And a lot of the biggest problems that you have in life that you're most ashamed of, embarrassed of, depressed about, whatever it is, that's the opportunity for the biggest happiness in your life because it's just, it's like having a low cost basis in investing. If you buy a stock for very cheap and it goes up, you make a ton of money. If you pay a lot of money for it to begin with, you're not going to do very well. So I think a lot of the biggest problems that we have in our life are like the springboards for some of the greatest happiness that we can have. Oh, thank you, Morgan, so much for sharing that and, and giving us yeah, just a little bit more of a peek into your life. Um, uh, so, um, Becky, uh, thank you for joining us. I, I think we have uh, already a few questions uh, lined up. Uh, should I just uh, jump in uh, with that, uh, uh, that first one that you sent my way? Yeah, if you want to go ahead and ask that question, that's great. We have a billion questions, so we'll probably won't get to them all, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, uh, maybe, um, uh, so uh, Morgan, uh, so, um, someone was asking, uh, many people in the communities we serve are low income and off, often marginalized by PAC. Um, do you have thoughts on how we could work with behaviors to help people move away from a p poverty mindset or belief that investing isn't for them? You know, I think, I think for a, a lot of people, if you, have, if you have grown up with not only the belief, but the truth that the odds financially were, were stacked against you, particularly in something like investing, that's a hard thing to break. And I think just understand, just being empathetic towards that mindset is, is really important. A lot of times in financial education, I kind of see that the, uh, the order in which things are taught tends to be kind of, kind of broken because for, particularly for, for younger people, if you say, Hey, I have a financial education training course for you. Step one, day one, lesson one, let's learn how to balance a checkbook. A, that's probably the right lesson, but B, you're going to bore the heck out of someone doing that. They're, they're, they're not going to pay attention. They're, they're, it's just going to be like, oh, this is, this is education. This is like going to school. And I, I, you know, this, it, it, it feels like a chore. I think if you can start with something like, hey, let's learn about compound interest and I, let's, not, let's forget about the stock market. Let's forget about becoming wealthy. Let's learn about how compound interest works in nature. Let's, how, let's learn about how it works in biology. So you can just understand how exponential growth works. And now once I got your mindset kind of trained and attuned and interested into how exponential growth works, now we can move on to seeing how, like what it did in the stock market. Because if you were to start off with those BIPOC people and day one and say, welcome to Wall Street, let's all learn how to get rich. I think by and large, that segment of the, of the community is going to say, I don't believe you. I've been, I've been to, like, that's just not the mindset that I'm in. So I think if you can start teaching the important finance skills of behavior around endurance and compounding and behavior and teach them through a non-finance mindset to where something that they're more likely to grasp onto, I think you could probably make more headway with that group of people than you would otherwise if you just sat down and taught them from an economics textbook from day one. When, and wouldn't you say that like just saving, even if it's just like five or ten dollars, uh, yeah, even even a quarter, or like if, if you could even like five dollars a month, I just, I that's what, well, I, I try to um, tell people myself is just yeah, just even just setting aside five dollars, <laughs> just getting into that saving mindset, and and having a, um, a strategy and, and a pattern, I think can be very helpful. I mean, all, all financial independence exists on a spectrum. So when people say financially independent, I don't mean you have to be Jeff Bezos to be financially independent. Like every dollar, it's, uh -oh. it's a piece of your future that you don't need to rely on. Uh-oh. Oh, no. Oh, no. 
Oh, looks like are we? Yeah, I think we're frozen, or, or Morgan's frozen, which is unfortunate. There's a lot of great top. Uh, information, a lot of great topic here, a lot of food for thought. And I think mm -hmm. for a lot of us, you know, based on the questions and the feedback that we're getting, it's trying to figure out how do we wrap that back into what um, what we do and who we serve and how, you know, we can help people to overcome those feelings of, you know, this, this just isn't for me, this investing, how does this apply to me? Um, you know, because I'm not going to be a Warren Buffett or um, which I listened to one of Morgan's speeches and uh, talks. And he said, that's not going to happen anyway. Cause Oh yeah, he's back. Yay. This is, this is what happens when you do live things on a hotel internet connection, but I'm back. Thank you for that. <laughs> that's awesome. I'm so glad you made it back. Um, we were just trying to ad lib there. No, anyway. Um, but, uh, oh, go ahead, Adam. Yeah, and, and Becky was noting, right, like how we, how we bring this back, right, Morgan, to to folks who um, many of us work with that don't have as many resources. And and just to, a little bit, uh, if you don't mind, borrow from some of the, the things you've noted, right, it's, um, uh, I think, simplifying, keeping things as simple as possible, uh, understanding that, you know, you, you can save money uh, or, or not, maybe I shouldn't say it that way, that, um, saving money is something that even you know, um, even if you don't really have an idea or, or uh, um, you know something in mind, just getting into that mindset of saving a little bit, like a couple dollars a, a month, can you know, start uh, well, just uh, getting uh, shifting some things around in your head and getting behaviors, uh, encouraging good behaviors, um, you know, and and as you know, we move forward. You know, that's such a great point because so many people, if you're of lower income, the idea of saving money is I'm saving money for something, a new car, a new house, a down, whatever it might be. And I think that's great. Saving money for a thing is, is great. But once you get into the mentality of I'm saving money for the idea that life will throw me surprises and I want to be independent, I'm not saving money for anything in particular. This is not for a house. This is not for new clothes. It's not for a new car. I'm saving money for independence and surprises. Once you have that mentality, then I think just saving money consistently every week, every month, $5 here, whatever it can be, whatever you can afford starts to gain a lot of purpose in your life. Uh, but I think for most people, if you're, if you are just stuck in the idea of money buys me things and therefore I'm going to save money to buy the next thing, you're not really saving for the idea that you might get laid off from your job. You might have a medical emergency, or you just want some independence in your life. Once you can instill that mentality in people. I think you can go a long way in, move, in terms of moving the needle. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. Sorry, Adam, go ahead. No, oh, Becky, I was going to turn it to you for some more questions. Okay. We just have a couple, a couple more minutes um, left. I think, you know, again, uh, that now just kind of turning that question a little bit more on how do we, are there, I, I know we, there's, you know, potentially some issues with gamification, but how do we move or how could we use FinTech to help um, even just to move into the savings arena, you know, with people and maybe gamification with savings, or is that like a bad, you know, bad idea? I don't know. No, I think, you know, for most people, for, for most workers, I would say the best financial resource that they have is, is their 401k allocation being automatically deducted from their paycheck. They don't need to do anything. I think if we can move to a basic savings product where it's like that, where it's like maybe maybe $10 from every paycheck is automatically diverted to a savings account. You don't need to do anything to it. You don't need to go in and make the, the withdrawal. It's just automatically... You, you, you get a thousand dollar paycheck and 990 of it goes to your checking account and ten dollars it goes to a to a savings account I think something like that it's so simple it's so basic but that can that can be really meaningful for people in terms of just taking the guesswork taking the activity out of it and automating it for them that's great thank you for that I know we're out of time Adam uh, did you want to say anything else uh, I just, just wanted to thank Morgan again I um, thank you. Uh, yeah, I just uh, really appreciate so much that he, uh, his perspectives and thoughts. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us today. Thank you, especially for Morgan and for Adam for, for diving into a uh, a conversation that covered a lot of ground. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to 
take a minute and reflect where I am in my own personal financial journey and using that to uh, inform how I meet participants where they are in their own financial journey. Uh, Jared, I know that we both work with folks in, in the everyday who are facing financial choices, people who uh, have been living, uh, experiencing poverty for a long time, all the way up to people who were making some good money up until yesterday. Uh, I'd be interested just to hear your, your thoughts, a, a quick 30 seconds on how do you uh, plan on using some of Morgan's thoughts? Uh, thanks, Ryan. <clears throat> I mean, I think I think I try. I, I do. I thought I think uh, Morgan offers some really good information. Stories that may feel like a little bit maybe higher level are the thirty thousand foot view around investing um, and things like that. That might not be the reality for a lot of the folks that many of us here are working with. But I think the lessons there, the underlying lessons, are sound in behaviors, and that's really where when I'm developing training and coaching folks around their finances. I really try to think start there your values your attitudes your mo your attitude attitudes towards money your behaviors all those things um, are super important and i think that's a good lesson i think morgan gives a lot of interesting anecdotes in his presentation today um, as well as in his writings um, really interesting to look at um, and i just wanted to say a couple things that i that i pulled away is you know keeping it simple with people not trying to overwhelm them with too much information and just having a plan in the first place is a good start. And I liked what he said about something like risk is what exists after you plan for all contingencies. You can never map all risk, but you can have a plan to avert, you know, to avoid some of the major risks and help people make some progress towards financial independence. So I thought there's some good nuggets there and enjoyed the presentation. Absolutely. I, I really appreciate your, your that thought, Jared. I, I, I want to echo that, especially as we move forward today. Uh, well, I promised you guys at the beginning of today that when you saw us, there would be a break. So I'm going to fulfill my promise. Uh, we're going to go into about a 10-minute break. You'll hear from us at around 10, 12, or maybe shortly after that, introducing our next speaker, John Maxfield. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that. So go get comfy, refill, re-energize, and we'll see you shortly. Bye, everyone.
All right. Well, thank you guys. And thank you, Columbia Bank, for bringing us our next session with John Maxfield. I'm going to push it over to Ryan to introduce John. Thanks, Jared. Uh, I hope everyone had a great break, uh, rested, refilled, stretched a little bit, danced maybe to the awesome music. Thanks, everybody, for, for being here and sticking with us. Our next guest is John Maxfield. He's a senior banking specialist at The Motley Fool, former editor-in-chief of Bank Director Magazine, as well as the executive director of the Robert G. Wilmers Integrity Prize, established in honor of the late chairman and CEO of m and Bank Corporation. John interviews the leading figures in the banking industry, including CEOs of many of the nation's biggest banks, hedge fund managers, authors, ac uh, academics, and, analysis, and analytics. He's a regular speaker, at many uh, banking industry events, conducts, conducts proprietary research on high-performing banks, and his work has been featured in Time, Business Insider, USA Today, and the Houston Chronicle, uh, among other publications like his book, The Cambian Explosion, The Dawning of a New Era in Banking. John, thank you very much for being with us, and take it away. I appreciate it very much, Ryan. Um, let me start with I know you already, you introed Morgan and everybody got to see Morgan speak. Um, but I just want to like second, so this is his book, The Psychology of Money. There is, in the writing world, there is a movement that is happening in the financial space that is trying to bring finances. This is very much what, you know, the Bank On movement is all about, that is trying to bring finances and simplify finances for the, for the everyday people who don't, can't, do like Morgan and I do and just, you know, spend all day studying the subject. And I just can't recommend Morgan's book enough. And Morgan really is at the forefront of this whole movement of simplifying finance for the average person. Uh, his book is just, it's just a terrific book. So I just wanted to put that, that plug in for, for Morgan. Um, if you all get his book. So I'm going to talk about something different than Morgan. Um, I'm going to talk about banking. I'm also going to talk about FinTech. I know that the subject matter of, um, we kind of the whole this forum this you know this this get together is about fintech i'm going to talk about that that's going to be a piece of what i'm going to talk about but what i'm going to do is i'm going to share a whole bunch of really interesting proprietary research that i have done studying kind of the top banks in the united states um it's just going to kind of tell the story of banking kind of what it's all about just kind of give you all kind of an inside view of of, of what banking why banking is hard why banking is so important um, and where fintech kind of fits into that into that whole thing. So let's start with, um, I want to start with a story, two stories, actually, just very, very briefly. So I sat back about 10 years ago, and the, the question that I've been unpacking ever since is, you know, what makes just a totally exceptional banker? What makes an exceptional bank? Like, what are the component pieces of this? And one of the things that you find, there's a theory in history called kind of the, the great man theory. I guess nowadays we call it kind of the great person theory, right? We're like one person can have a huge influence on history. And what I have found is that I don't know, I'm not a historian. I don't know if that is or is not true in the in, in world affairs, but it is true in banking. It's absolutely true in banking. The person who leads one of these organizations has an enormous influence on it. And so when you look at you think about the top bankers in the United States over the past really 40 years, and th that is a significant time period, and I'll explain that a little bit later. It's kind of its own era of banking. These two gentlemen are really the top bankers in the United States. Now, there's some private banks, too, that are, that are very good, but these, these, are, these, are public, these are bank CEOs of publicly traded banks. The gentleman on the left is a guy by the name of Robert G. Wilmers. The guy on the right is a guy by the name of Michael McLodnick. So Robert Wilmers, um, as Ryan said in my introduction, I actually run a, a charitable foundation that's in his name. He ran a bank by the name of m and Bank Corps. And m and is based in, of all places, Buffalo, New York, which is, you know, if you think about kind of Buffalo's, the trajectory of Buffalo's history and kind of a lot of those big cities, kind of that, that border along the Great Lakes, these were great industrial cities. You're like the cities like Pittsburgh, cities like Cleveland, um, Duluth, uh, you know, Minnesota, like all these really big, important cities during a very significant period in the American in American history. 
But since the post-industrial period has kind of started, all of them have been in decline. And so you think like, wow, like that's interesting that such an amazing bank is based in all places, Buffalo, New York. The same thing is actually kind of true about Glacier Bank. So this is, I'm in Portland, Oregon right now. I'm like half a mile away from Adam Stein. Adam was the one who interviewed Morgan. It's literally, we just like, we almost live in the same neighborhood. But Glacier Bank is in our neck of the woods. It's a bank that kind of spread throughout the Rocky Mountain region. And this is the bank run by, by Mick Blodnick. And so you say, well, like, oh, well, John, like, you know, is that just your opinion that these are the two kind of top banks in the United States? Well, yeah, it is, but it's actually, it's also based on some quantitative evidence. So if you take every single publicly traded bank in the United States and you calculate their all-time total shareholder returns, the, the, the amount of value that these banks have created since they became publicly traded companies, and then you sort all of those companies into buckets in terms of like the amount of value that they've created. That's what this chart is right here that we're looking at. And if you look on the far right hand side of that chart, there's that bar that contains about 10 banks that's in orange as opposed to the gold. And that is where Mick and Robert Wilmers' banks will kind of fall in terms of performance in the United States banking industry. And it's not just that they fall into that category. When you take those 10 banks and you put them up against themselves, this is how m and and Glacier kind of come out. So they're the two bars, I'm sure it's obvious, the two orange bars on the left. MTB is m and Bancor's ticker, stock ticker. GBCI is Glacier Bancor's ticker. So what you see here, and this is this is actually data as of October 2018. There's one other bank that is kind of in the past year and a half, that's kind of past two years that has kind of come up. It's a bank based in, in San Francisco. I'll talk about that later in the presentation. But it's not just that these two banks are, are the best. They're the best by a long ways, by a long ways. And so you ask yourself, like, well, what is it about these banks that not only allows them to be the best, but to be the best by such a significant margin. And so I have two explanations for that. There's a lot of explanations, but I have, to, if you summarize them, you reduce it to the core elements. There's really two core elements to this. The first, and this is one of those things that sounds like super cheesy and super cliche, but these are Bob Wilmers and Mick Blodnick were just obsessive about learning. I know a lot of journalists who interviewed Bob Wilmers, like everybody he worked with, like, when you went to dinner with Bob Wilmers, like he never let you eat because he was just constantly peppering you with questions, constantly peppering, peppering you with questions, trying to figure out like what you're about, like trying to learn any sort of business that you're involved in, all that kind of stuff. Mick Blodnick kind of was the same way. I once asked him, you know, what separates the most successful people from others? And in, in his, this was his response. He says, in my mind, it's their constant quest to learn. Uh, th again, that sounds cliche, but this is an overarching lesson, lesson that applies everywhere. Banking is just one example. But there's also a more quantitative explanation. And this is really the lesson from these two stories. So if you take Glacier Bank Course peer groups, these are similar banks to Glacier that it includes in regulatory filings to show shareholders how it performs relative to not just like Bank of America, which is like a gazillion times bigger, or like a tiny little bank in a small town, but how it compares to other similarly, similarly situated banks. And if you look at the CEO compensation of Glacier Bank Corp compared to other banks in its peer group, here's where Mick Blodnick ranks. It's not just that he earned the least amount of money. He earned the least amount by a long ways. The average in his peer group in 2011, and I use 2011 because after 2012, his board of directors forced him to increase his salary because they said, look, when you retire, we need to like be able to hire somebody and nobody's going to take the salary that you work for. So it's not just that he earned less, he earned significantly less. The average was 1.7 million. He earned something like $300,000. I mean, just way, way, way lower than anybody else. And the exact same thing is true with Bob Wilmers. So this is same thing. This is this is m ts peer group that looks at the CEO compensation. And this is a three-year average from 2014 until 2016. He passed away in 2017. So the last three years of his tenure at this bank. 
So this is a man who ran this incredibly successful bank, just like Mick, the, the two most successful banks in the kind of the public banking universe. And yet both of these gentlemen earned the least amount of money in their peer groups. And you say like, what is the lesson from this? Right. They should be theoretically right in terms of a capitalist society like they should be earning the most. Right. Well, the lesson is really simple. And again, this is a lesson that applies not just to banking, but to everything, everything. And it is you have to take your fiduciary duties seriously. If you are in it for yourself, there's going to be there's, there are negative repercussions for everybody else. But if you're in it for all those different your communities, your shareholders, your employees, your customers, if you're in it for everybody else, that's where success really lies. And so that's kind of the overarching, if I were to summarize the research I've done over the past 10, 11, 12 years, that really is kind of the summary of it. That, that is what drives success in banking. And I believe it's what drives success in any field. All right. So let me give you a roadmap for what we're going to talk about today. First, I'm going to introduce banking as a peculiar business. I'm going to explain why that is. And if you understand why banking is a peculiar business. You can work backwards into everything else. These are really the first principles for understanding banking. You can work back into you know, the priorities of the bank on movement. You can work all these other things, but it's important to know those, those first principles. We're then going to talk about a really important concept in finance. Morgan kind of touched on this, but we're going to talk about a really important finance uh, kind of theory in finance that Im impacts bank performance, how banks operate, all that kind of stuff. And that, that theory is called variance strain. I'm then going to walk through kind of a different way to think about banks and how they perform and all of those different things. We call that the Maxwell Decino score because it's work I've done under a research grant uh, by a fintech company named Encino. Many of you probably know Encino because it's it's really dominant in the in the cloud banking services space. I'm then going to talk about growth frameworks in the banking industry. And the reason I'm going to talk about these growth frameworks is because that's going to tee up the next piece. And this is where I we come back into this fintech theme. We're going to talk about, can I think about it as kind of false positive, but it's really, we are in this new era in banking. And I'm a traditionalist. So I'm not one who goes around and says like, oh, we're in a new era all the time. Like, I don't believe that. But I do believe that we we are in a new era. We entered a new era somewhere around 12 years ago, in and around the financial crisis. And then that new era has kind of changed the name of the game for banks. And then that's where the fintech conversation comes into the equation. Then I'm just going to finish up with a cautionary tale about Washington Mutual, which is very uh, appropriate because this is you know, kind of the bank on uh, you know Washington Forum. So you know this was the hometown bank. It was the biggest bank failure in American history that went under in and around the financial crisis of 2008. All right, let's talk about the peculiar business of banking. Jamie Dimon, everybody knows Jamie Dimon, right? Jamie Dimon is the chairman and CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase. Jamie Dimon is one of the most sophisticated bankers in the United States. He's brilliant. He's just a very, very, very good banker. He's kind of worked up on, uh, through some really powerful and uh, popular, well-known financiers throughout his, throughout his years. And now he's become, you know, chairman and CEO of, of, of J.P. Morgan Chase. Why well, he became chairman and CEO in 2005 or 2006. And he, when he explains banking to like his mom or like somebody just on the street, he analogizes it to a retail business. And he talks about specifically to Walmart. And there's something to be said for that. Because if you think about like a shoe store, what does a shoe store do? It goes out and buys shoes cheap, right? And then sells them at a higher price. And then the difference between those two things is in a sense, it's revenue. And then, you know, you take out your expenses and there's your profit. So you're just a bank is just buying dollars cheap, primarily from depositors, and then lending that money out at a higher rate or a higher price to borrow to, to borrowers. Well, that is a really helpful framework to think, but there's an important point. So while banking is like a retail business in that regard, if you look at how, say, J.P. Morgan Chase compares to Walmart, there's a, the biggest difference is the amount of leverage that a JP Morgan Chase uses. And you can see this on this chart. So this compares the, some kind of the biggest companies on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And it looks at uh, their liabilities as a ratio to equity, which is just one way to think about leverage. And what this shows is that JP Morgan Chase is leveraged like four, they borrow $14 for every $1 worth of capital. 
Whereas all these other companies like Walmart borrows like $2 for every $1 worth of capital. Now, that is great. That is amazing in terms of value creation. This just shows like, you know, a typical bank earning just like kind of your average return. Again, like Morgan was talking about, it's not just about earning the highest return. What's more important is that you learn an average return consistently. So this is a bank that earns just an average return consistently over a long period of time, over 48 years. And what you see here is that if you just run kind of an average bank and just like every single year, consistent, consistent performance, you produce an enormous amount of value. You will double your investor's capital every six years. And again, like in the investing space, I mean, that's about as good as it gets. But there's a downside to all that leverage. And that's why it's important to expand one's thought, not just thinking about a bank as a retail store. And the reason, the downside to all that leverage is that it makes a banking institution incredibly fragile. The mistakes that you make in banking are magnified by that leverage. And so this is a point that Warren Buffett makes in his 1990 shareholder letter, which is a, one of the probably the most important things that has ever been written about banking, that letter. And he says, look, when assets are 20 times equity, they're not as high now because we've changed capital requirements and stuff like that. But they're still, like we said, like 14, 10, 12 times equity. Mistakes that involve only a small portion of assets can destroy a major portion of equity. Washington Mutual is a perfect example. So if you look at Washington Mutual, it's non-performing assets. So these are like loans, principally loans that have gone into non-payment. If you look at its non-performing assets as a percent of total assets, so you, like your non-performing loans divided by all of your loans. When it failed in 2008, only 3.6% of its assets were non-performing. The, the way you can think about that is like, it got like a 94 or 96.4% on its test and it still failed. And the reason that is, is because all of that leverage that banks use leaves them incredibly vulnerable to failure. A guy by the name of Walter Badgett, who like kind of wrote the bank that the Bible of central banking, which is one of the foundational books on banking, he explained it this way. He said, look, you can afford to run much less risk in banking than in commerce. So I like Walmart. And you must take greater precautions because a banker dealing with the money of others and money payable on demand must be always, as it were, looking behind him and seeing if payment should be asked for. And the reason for that is that as soon as anybody hears that a bank is in trouble, they start pulling out their deposits. And so then it causes this liquidity crisis, is known in, in kind of in common parlance as a, as a bank run. And that's where that fragility comes into play. So the margin for error in banking is so much smaller than the margin for error in just about any other business. And you can see that right here. So this is, shows how much capital Washington Mutual had at the time it failed. It had more capital than JP Morgan Chase, Citigroup, US Bank Corp, Bank of America, Wells Fargo. But the problem is that people lost confidence in it. And as soon as people lose confidence in a bank, it's kind of over for that, that bank's story. And uh, uh, Irving Sprague, who is the head of the, the FDIC during a very pivotal period in time in the United States, we had a whole bunch of bank failures. He puts it this way. He says, look, Bank confidence is a fragile read, and a troubled bank is damaged by any rumors, true or not. So that's kind of the first. So as a general rule, again, Jamie Diamond says, look, banking is like a retail business, but there's a the big exception with leverage. Well, there's another exception, and I refer to this as infinite demand. Okay, so let's go back to our shoe store, our shoe store example. L let's actually use a different example. Let's use a Mercedes dealership. Let's say you own a Mercedes dealership, okay? And you decide, I want to sell a lot more Mercedes Benzes. Well, one way you could do it is you could drop the price of Mercedes Benz, Mercedes, a brand new Mercedes Benz to $10. You're going to sell a lot more of, of those cars, right? But even somebody like me who would go in and buy some of these things, there is a limit to how many Mercedes Benzes you can buy, even if they're $10, right? Like you have to park them somewhere. Like we have a two-car garage. Like I could... I could park a few on the street, park two in the garage, but like I couldn't have like a thousand of them. 
the same is not true in banking. In banking, if you set the rate of a loan low enough and the terms of a loan lenient enough, there is literally no limit to the amount of loans that people will want you to give to them because you, they could just get a, an infinite amount of loans and then just constantly be using that to like pay off the loans. So like th this could go on forever and ever and ever. So what that means is that a bank, unlike virtually any other business, can grow as fast as it wants to in the short run. But there's a downside to doing so. So this shows us the CNI loan growth. So these are basically just your traditional commercial loans, the growth in that portfolio at the 10 biggest US banks between 1976 and 1981. What you see is you have two banks that kind of stick out for number one and number two, Continental Illinois, which in 1984, it grew the fastest, but then in 1984, it became the first too big to fail bank in the United States. Then you see Security Pacific, it grew the second fastest. And as you can see, it was acquired under, under duress by Bank of America in 1991. So that's, that's kind of the consequence of that infinite demand. And, and William Dimchak, who's the chairman and CEO of, of PNC Bank, who's, which is PNC Financial Services Group, which is just a terrific, he's a terrific banker, it's a terrific organization. He says, look, we can make loan growth be anything you guys want for a period of time before it comes back to haunt us. And so that's kind of the underlying point of infinite demand. So now we've built out two exceptions to this rule that a bank is kind of like a retail store. So now you can kind of encapsulate these into this third really important exception. And this goes back to Warren Buffett's 1990 shareholder letter. He says, look, remember he said in that earlier quote that like mistakes have been the rule rather, or, you know, that banks are really susceptible to mistakes. But here he says, look, and mistakes have been the rule rather than the exception at many major banks. And most of those have resulted from a managerial failing that we described last year when discussing the quote, institutional imperative. And the way he then defines the institutional imperative in that, in that letter is that it's the tendency of executives to mindlessly imitate the behavior of their peers, no matter how foolish it may be to do so. The perfect example, uh, now let's take this, let me just a quick interlude, then I'll give you a perfect example of, of the institutional imperative and how it works. One of the things that we have seen that research has captured is that banks that are publicly traded are particularly prone to this. And the reason that is, is because they have all of this external pressure, from analysts, from you know, pub, big, large institutional investors, all of these things. And so what you see here is that that yellow line shows banks that were previously private and then went public. And this shows kind of their risk appetite or how risky they were in terms of their operations. And what you see is that, that, that red dotted line, that dashed line that comes down in the middle, that's the point at which those banks went public. And as you can see, they get much, much riskier after that. The perfect example of the institutional imperative, I mean, it's like a textbook example, is, is Chuck Prince's quote, who was, he was the former chairman and CEO of Citigroup. And this is on the, on the eve of the financial crisis. And probably everybody remembers this, right? Like, as long as the music is playing, you've got to get up and dance. Well, here's what happened to Citigroup's stock price because of that thought process. And just to drive this point home, that's when Chuck Prince said that. So he's going out, he's saying like, all these other banks are doing this crazy stuff. So we need to do this crazy stuff too, because ex people expect us to keep up. Well, in banking, that is a total recipe for disaster, as you can see with this chart. And so when you put all of these exceptions together, leverage, infinite demand, and the institutional imperative, what you end up with is an incredibly cyclical industry with all that leverage because they leverage up. And then as soon as something happens, when they deleverage, that's a very steep decline. So you have these constant cycles in the banking industry that go all the way back through time. You can study, you can study banking and finance as far back as you want, and you see cycles all the time. And a woman by the name of Barbara Stewart, who was the chief economist at Chubb Insurance, is just a brilliant, brilliant person in terms of like how all these, how the financial world works. She's, she, she kind of summarized it like this. She said, look, it's in the nature of an industry whose structure is competitive, like banking, and whose conduct is driven by supply. And again, that's kind of that infinite demand point. They have cycles that only end badly. And that is exactly the case. 
So yeah, we've had all of these cycles have something like 14, 15 cycles since the modern American banking industry came into being in the finance, in the civil war. And since then we've had, well, 21,000 bank mergers that that was actually since 1935 when the FDIC started collecting that data. We've had 17,000, about 300 bank failures since 1865. So again, since the civil war, and then yet the current population of banks in the United States today is less than 5,000. So what this shows is that if you want to think about banking, it's good to think about it in a simplified term of, of a retail business. That's one way to think about it. But there's these nuances. And as a result of those nuances, really the way to think about banking is that it's a war of attrition. And so you got to figure out how to win that war of attrition. And you got to figure out how to avoid the unforced errors that have led to kind of the downfall of so many banks in the past. All right. So now we're just talk about this concept in finance and it relates to, to cycles and all of these things that we, we just talked about. And that concept is called variant strain. Okay. So if you, if someone would go to you and say like, where do you think the highest valued bank in the United States is? And by value, I mean kind of how much it, your price to book value ratio. It's, it's a way of saying, how much are, willing, are investors willing to pay for a bank relative to how much capital it has? The typical bank, they trade for like two times book value, 1.5 times book value, one times book value. But there's one that trades for way, way, way higher than that. You say like, where would that be? It's probably in some like financial center, right? Where there has all this activity and all this business. Well, that is not true. The most highly valued publicly traded bank in the United States is based in Abilene, Texas. And look, I don't know, you know how many of y'all have been to Abilene, Texas. I went to law school in Dallas, which is like not too far away. Abilene, Texas is in West Texas, kind of on the border of West Texas. If it weren't for the Permian Basin, which is this huge oil field up in that in and around that area, Abilene, Texas is hard to imagine that Abilene, Texas would be anything more than just a, you know, a, a two horse town. But yet the most highly valued publicly traded bank is based there. And you have to step back and say like, why is that? Like, why is the, this darling in banking based in Abilene, Texas of all places? And so this is kind of goes to the point I was making. Here's the price to book value ratio, of basically the regional banks that are comparable to first financial bank shares, which is the bank in Abilene. And what this shows you is that it's not that first financial is again, the most, highly valued. It's the most highly valued. It's like a giraffe among Shetland ponies. I mean, it is like way, way more valuable than all these other banks. And so what an investor would, if you're just talking to your average investor who doesn't know anything about this, they would say, well, like that clearly is because First Financial must be the most profitable bank among them. It must be the most profitable bank compared by a long ways. But here's, here's a dot plot that compares profitability, which is on the on the on the x-axis on the bottom, with the price to book value ratio, which is on the y-axis. Here's first financial. So yes, like it is profitable, but it ranks fourth for this time period, this five-year average time period that I pulled up that previous chart that I created that previous chart from. It ranks fourth in terms of profitability, and yet it's so much higher value. And so it's like a riddle. You say like, whoa, like how do you square that circle? Well, here's the way you square that circle. If you look at the first financial's performance, so it's profitability through a full cycle, going back 15 years, back to 2005. So that's the highs before the crisis, the lows of the financial crisis, and then the recovery since then. If you look at its performance since then, and you take a standard deviation, which is just a measure of how much something how volatile something is on an annualized basis, on an annual basis, it has the least volatility of any bank on that index. So that's just how much it, you know, it, its profitability changes on a year to year basis. And you say like, oh, well, like maybe there's something to this. And again, here's Morgan, right? And Morgan said this earlier, average returns for an above average period of time equal extreme outperformance it's the most obvious secret in investing. And I would tell you that it is also the most obvious secret in banking. And so this goes to this, this theory in finance. It's not, 
I don't know if it's a theory or phenomenon in finance known that they call variance strain. And what this tells you is that, look, if you have two, say, investment portfolios that earn the same average return in any given year over, say, a 10-year time period, so the same average return, the one with less volatility on a year-to-year -year basis is going to produce higher returns. And that is exactly the case in banking. So it's all about, Morgan talked about, you know, the ups and the downs and the behavioral aspects of all of this stuff. It's the same thing in banking. It's about the behaviors. It's about staying rational through these irrational times when people get super elated because everything seems to be going great. It's not doing crazy stuff at that time. And then when everything tanks and everything seems so horrible, it's also not kind of falling into the gutter with everybody else. It's just trying to kind of keep an average kind of mind through this whole thing. And that is the same in investing. It's the same in banking. Charlie Munger has a great kind of quote that summarizes this. Charlie Munger is Warren Buffett's kind of longtime partner. He's the vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway. He's just like this kind of savant in the, in the investing world. And he says, look, the first rule of compounding is to never interrupt it unnecessarily. And banking and investing and everything is all about creating wealth, and creating returns for your investors, whatever you want to think of. Everything circles, centers around this idea of compounding. And so the key is just consistent performance, whether you're an investor, whether you're a bank. So that's kind of like an overarching take of like what it is that makes banks super duper successful. Well, now let's talk about the, a thing I call the Maxfield Encino score. So one of the problems with the banking, and we saw this with Cont that chart with Continental Illinois and Security Pacific, you know, after they grew really fast and then failed, one of the problems with banking is that if you look at a bank's performance in any given year, that's really subject to manipulation. If, if things are going really well, a bank can grow as fast as it wants and have super high profitability. So you don't want to judge banks' performances based on really short-term measures. You want to think about it more broadly. And again, this kind of goes back to that point. It is one of the oldest adages in our business, the banking business, that the lender that grows fast is the lender with future losses. And this is by a guy by the name of uh, Chris Flowers, who runs, he's the CEO of JC Flowers and Company. And so as opposed to just looking last year, how bank did, the last three years, you wanna kind of look at it through a prism of four different variables. You wanna say, look, you look at the, you. It does matter how much they earn. So you want to look at the average kind of amplitude of their performance. You want it to be high, but just not insanely high. So if you want to judge a bank, you've got to look at the average amplitude, not over a year or two years or three years. You've got to look at it through a full cycle. So in this case, taking it all the way back again to 2005 through 2020. You want to look at the average of that. You want to look at the trough. So like, like the lowest perform profitability that a bank had over that time period. And the reason the trough matters so much is because like we saw with Citigroup, you can earn a high return for a long period of time and just one year have a, a horrible, horrible year. And you have to dilute your shareholders to such an extent, selling new, selling new shares to raise capital to cover all of your losses that it can wipe out years and years of performance. In Citigroup's case, it could take a century for its stock and its shareholders prior to the crisis to recover what they kind of the, the, the value of their investment in that bank going all the way back in that back to then. And then the third variable, and this is what we just talked about is volatility. You want to look at the standard deviation of the profitability again, through a full cycle. So how much did it go up and down on a year to year basis? And then you just want to make sure this duration is just kind of a, a uh, a variable that captures to make sure that like, you know, a bank that was founded last year shouldn't be weighted the same that with bank that was founded a hundred years ago, because a bank that was founded a hundred years ago has survived through so many different cycles. Whereas a bank that was founded say last year, although there weren't very many banks that were founded last year, um, it hasn't really had to survive through any cycles. So you don't really know anything about, you know, how it will, you, know, you have no predictive sense for how it may or may not perform in the next cycle. So you take that, so you take the data, right? You go, you can go to the FDIC. The FDIC, the bank, one of the things that's interesting about banking is that there's no other industry where you can go to a single source and get performance data of every single 
institution in that industry and not just publicly traded institutions, private institutions. You can get data on the performance, the quarterly performance and annual performance of every single bank in the United States going back to the early 90s from the FDIC. And so if you go and you grab all that data and then you put it through kind of this, this algorithm where you're looking at average amplitude, your, your trough, your volatility and the duration of the, of the bank's existence, and you put it through that kind of like sieve, what you find, and then you rank the banks based on the ones with the highest performance in that regard, here's what you get. You get this kind of list of banks that, I don't know, maybe some of you know these banks. I study banks. I've been studying banks for over a decade. I've never heard of most of these banks. I, I don't know if I've heard of any of these banks, to be totally honest with you. So then you have to step back and say, like, well, we look at these banks. You have to dig into them and say, well, what can we learn by these really, really good banks measured in this totally different way than people are measuring banks today? So you take a look at First Credit Bank. So this is First Credit Bank's return on assets, which is really like the best profitability metric that you can use for banking. And this takes, again, all the way through a full cycle. You can see the First Credit Bank's profitability is way higher than the industry average. And so you say, well, how is that? What is, what is First Credit Bank? Well, it's this relatively small bank that's based in, of all places, Beverly Hills, California. And what it does is it lend, its specialty is lending to developers of those really, really expensive homes that you see on like, you know, the TV where they're like touring these things. They have those like infinity pools that look out on like downtown Los Angeles. This bank lends money to um, this bank lends money to the people who build those. Now you look step back and think that sounds really risky, but as you can see, even through the financial crisis, 2008, 2009, its profitability yeah dipped, but it still earned really good money. Here's another bank that's on that list, First Western Federal Savings Bank. And again, this compares the return on assets of First Western Federal Savings Bank versus the industry. Same story, right? Just consistently higher returns than the industry. Well, what does First Western Federal Savings Bank do? It has this, it's based in Rapid City, South Dakota, and has this very unusual niche where it lends money to people who have IRAs who want to use those assets in their IRAs as collateral to buy real estate. And so it's figured out this unusual niche and it's able, it just stays in that niche and just perform, just kind of pounds on the niche, pounds on that niche, pounds on that niche. And that's the performance that they've gotten out of that. So what we see from those two banks, and you, you can see the same with a lot of these other banks, is that if you find yourself in a niche, and this is a lot of the conversation in the fintech industry right now, if you find yourself in a small niche and you can dominate that niche, you can really do quite well. Well, the other element that we learn from kind of going that through these top banks in the United States based on their performance through the full, full, full cycle is that all of those banks are really, really efficient. So the efficiency ratio, which is it's a percentage of how much of your revenue you're spending on your expenses. So let's say a bank earns $100 million in revenue and it spends 25 million on that on expenses, its efficiency, if its efficiency ratio is going to be 25%, which is the case with First Credit Bank. Well, the typical bank, its efficiency ratio, you can see this kind of on the left, is closer to 60%. So again, like it makes sense, right? If you're like spending a lot less than you're bringing in, like your performance is going to be a lot better. And so again, we'll go back to our friend Warren Buffett. Like this is how he summarizes it. He says, look, in a such a commodity like business, which banking is, right? A dollar is a dollar is a dollar, no matter what bank you're borrowing it from. Only a very low cost operator or someone operating in a protected and usually small niche can sustain high profitability levels. So there you go. That's what banking is all about. Either operating efficiently or operating, finding a niche and then operating within the niche. That's where competitive advantage lies in banking. All right, let's talk about growth frameworks in banking because this is going through a huge change right now. All right, so this is that list I talked about at the very beginning when I was talking about Glacier Bank and M&T Bank. So this is a list of all publicly traded banks in the United States ranked by their total all-time shareholder, all-time total shareholder return. So that's dividends, 
plus share price appreciation, how much all of that has gone up or been returned to shareholders going back to their IPOs when they went public. And what you see is that, now, so this is an updated list for today, as opposed to the list I showed you earlier, which was updated through October 2018. What you see is that SVB Financial Group, so that's the parent company of Silicon Valley Bank, it's really done well over the past two years. Um, and so it's kind of like, kind of made its way to the top over Glacier and, and M&T Bank. But so you say, okay, well, what is it about some of these banks that kind of leads to... Um, their success. And a big part of it is how they grow, how not just they create value, but they grow and create value at the same time. So in terms of Glacier's case, so it was just a small bank based in Kalispell, Montana, which is in the Flathead Valley in kind of Northwest Montana. This is, if you've ever been to Glacier National Park, I mean, it's an amazing place. Um, and it was just, when Mick kind of started the bank, it was just a tiny little bank. He becomes CEO in 1998. They expanded Idaho by buying a bank. They expanded Wyoming by buying a bank. They expanded Utah by buying a bank. They expanded Colorado by buying a bank. They expanded Washington by buying a bank. They expanded Arizona by buying a bank. And so he was a really, really good bank acquirer. And the reason Mick was such a Mick Blodnick was such a good acquirer of banks is that everybody wanted to work with him. They just loved this guy. He was an incredibly humble guy, just the friendliest guy you could you could ever know. And so he wouldn't go in and pay like a bargain basement price, he would just pay a reasonable price for banks that he bought in these little communities like Torrington, Wyoming. And he would then keep the management in place. So he just like let them continue doing their thing, but then they were just under Glacier's umbrella. So they had all these additional resources, better technology, larger spending credit limits, all these different things. And so what you saw is that all these subsidiaries that they bought just exploded in growth. And so this is from one of Mick's, this is from Mick's final presentation as the CEO of US of Glacier Bank, which was in 2016. And it shows, kind of just walks through some of the, the banks that they bought and how much those banks grew after Glacier acquired them. I mean, you have 1,600%, 1,100%. I mean, just massive growth for some of these underlying institutions. And so this is kind of a, in the banking vernacular, this is kind of known as the uncommon partnership where you go in, you're friendly. You kind of bring them into a friendly embrace and you just let them do their thing, but do it better with more resources. The second bank, and again, these are the banks we talked about at the very beginning, is M&T Bank Corp. And so it had a different approach to how it grew, yet it still produced a ton of value. And so this is Renee Jones. Renee is the current chairman and CEO of M&T Bank. He's Robert Wilmers' successor. He says, look, this bank was built and all of its performance is based on capitalizing on banks who've made mistakes and us walking down the street and introducing ourselves to those individuals. So again, banking is a super duper highly leveraged in industry. So even small errors can compound and leave you vulnerable to either failure or being taken over by a better capitalized competitor. And that's what Renee is talking about here. In m ts case, here's, here's a perfect example of how it did it. So this is this kind of shows cycles in banking based on the net charge off ratio, the percentage of loans that banks were charging off in any given year. So the first bank that uh, M&T Bank acquired under Robert Wilmers was East New York Savings Bank, and it bought it right after the financial, uh, the, there was a huge crash in 1987. They bought one kind of at the height of the uh, savings and loan crisis, bought a second one at the height of the savings and loan crisis. It bought all First Financial, which is a, which was a large bank based in Maryland, after it suffered a large trading loss, it bought Wilmington Trust, which is this amazing asset management company, investment management company. Um, it bought it at the height of the financial crisis, and then it bought Hudson City Bank Corp, which is a bank based uh, in New Jersey, again in and around the time of the financial crisis. It bought other banks here and there throughout as well, and kind of using a different strategy. This is really the strategy that M&T was known for. When crises happen, go in, you can buy, you can pick up a bank for pennies on the dollar, recapitalize it, and then grow that, grow that thing again under a different and, and more sound philosophy. Well, those are the two primary growth frameworks in the banking industry over the past 40 years, since the deregulation rave kind of came into being in the late 70s and in mid 80s. But now you have banks that are thinking like, 
This is no longer the case. So you have here's Andy Sasiri. He's the chairman and CEO of U.S. Bank. Now it is this is U.S. Bank is like an incredibly well-run bank. Um, it's a different bank that was today than it was 20 years ago when it was run kind of by a different group of individuals. Um, but it's always been a consistently well-run institution. And I asked Andy one time, and we were sitting in the U.S. Bank Corp building in, in in Portland. I asked him, said like, tell me about like what's going on in banking today. He says, look, the calculus around acquiring a bank has changed dramatically. And U.S. Bank or bought banks, I'm sure many people on this call are familiar with this, like bought banks all the time, all over the country. And so you think like, okay, well, like if you look at U.S. Bank course history, that's absolutely true. So if you go back and you see that, that kind of that sharp increase in and around 2001, that's when U.S. Bank or completed this kind of mergers of equal with this other bank that was like, these banks were run actually by brothers. This is an incredible story. But since then, until just recently, U.S. Bank has, for all intents and purposes, only grown organically. So since the financial crisis, it's you know, gone from something like $180 billion in assets up to $550, you know, roughly $550 billion in assets, all by growing organically. And the point that Andy makes is that like, you can grow and you can grow in a way that creates a lot of value and you don't have to buy these other banks to do that. And we saw a perfect example of this over the past two years. So this shows you, this shows Bank of America's kind of growth in a couple of different areas through the pandemic. So on the left, you see the digital percent of total sales that were, so you have total sales, the percent of those that were made digitally. You can see for a long time, they're just kind of increasing by 1% during the financial crisis, shot up to 45%, from 32% to 45%. Same thing on the mobile check deposits. This was already a mature technology, but when the when the fin when the coronavirus crisis hit, it accelerated even that, even such a mature aspect of the banking industry. So the point is that okay, the banking growth is critically important as banking. Growth is ch changing right now, according to Andy Sasiri. You look at statistics like that. So now the question is, why? Why is it changing, and where are we at today? And so this gets to this point about technology and all of those different things. Let me start with a story about all of this. So in the 1930s, a bank by the name of Union Bank, which was the one that U.S. Bank Corp just announced that it's acquiring, ironically, came out with this brand new technology. And it was where you could make deposits in this like fancy new way. And it was banking by mail. So commercial customers could make deposits by giving it to the U.S. Postal Service. 20 years later, 50% of Union Bank's deposits were made by mail. And so if you step back and you think like, oh, like if you were thinking about this or writing about this as an analyst or a commentator, you'd be like, oh, well, you know, traditional banking is dead. It's over. You know what I mean? Like sayonara, bank branches. Well, <laughs> here's the truth. In 1950, since 1956, which is when... 50% of its deposits were made by bank by mail. Here's what has happened to bank, the number of bank branches in the United States. They've gone from like 6,000 or 8,000 up to peaking out at over 80,000. Now, we're, you know, we, as everybody knows, we're starting that decline ever since. And so this is what I mean by false positives. It has been claimed over and over and over again through history that the traditional banking business model and distribution model is dead. That was the case with bank by mail. It was the case when phones came out. Everybody remembers when ATMs came out. People thought, well, why are you going to need bank branch if you have ATMs? Well, ATMs came out, you know, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. And yet, you know, we, we know where bank branches have gone since then. And so the question is, is like, okay, we've had all these claims when computers came out, when the internet came out, when the phone came out, all these claims along the way, bank, traditional banking is dead. Traditional banking is dead. Traditional banking is dead. Where that same claim is being made right now in the fintech space, in that context. So the question is, is that true? Or is it just like all these other false positives in the past? And I believe, and I'm a traditionalist, I believe that this time is actually different. Um, let me explain very briefly why. You can break the history of modern American banking into four different eras. The first lasted from when modern American banking was founded in the Civil War, up through the Second World War. And the Second World War was basically the end, for all intents and purposes, the end of the Great Depression. 
During that time period, you had bank failures all the time. And kind of Morgan talked about this. It was in the 1930s in the Great Depression with the FDIC and all this other regulatory infrastructure came into being that made the banking industry much more secure, much more stable. And also you had the people who lived through that period, the financial, the Great Depression in particular, who were like, okay, we don't want to take risks like we were taking in the 1920s. Like we paid for that. That was too painful. We don't want to go through that again. So you, after that, you have this period, this, the second period, the era of modern American banking known as the great moderation. And what you see is that um, no bank failures, very, very uh, calm period in the banking industry, nothing really going on, growth very pedestrian, profitability very pedestrian, no risk taking, no failures. And then that third era starts in 1973. And it's that third era that just ended under my kind of hypothesis. And we now kind of moved into the fourth era. So now I'm going to tell you about kind of that change, what talk about the third era for the purpose of talking about where we are today. Ryan, are you coming on to do a video or something? Uh, I'm here to ask you a few questions. So if you have a couple of, of uh, tying in, I'll jump in uh, as soon as you're, you're ready to, to field a few questions. All right, give me give me five more minutes, Ryan. I'll blast through this, and then um, and then we'll be ready for some questions. All right, so 1973. So everything is calm. Then 1973 hits. What happens in 1973? You have the Yom Kippur War. What happens in the Yom Kippur War is you have a, uh, an oil crisis in the world because the OPEC countries said because the United States was supporting Israel in retaliation for that, we're going to enact an embargo on oil in the United States. To oil exports to the United States. So what happens? Price of oil shoots up. When the price of oil shoots up, because all goods travel, you know, in one way or other, they need energy to get from one place to another. So that causes prices of everything to go through the roof. Prices of everything goes through the roof. You know, you have these cars lining up at gas stations. You have Jimmy Carter saying like, "Don't turn on your heater, just wear a sweater." And then you have. Paul Volcker come in as chairman of, as the chairman of the Federal Reserve, smoking a cigar in front of Congress. Those were the days um, coming in to aggressively go after that inflation. You go he aggressively goes after that inflation by jacking up interest rates as much as twenty percent on short term interest rates in the early in nineteen eighty and nineteen eighty one, and then ever since then, rates have been coming down. Well, that chart this interest rate chart is one that should be seared into every banker's and financial person's mind because this is a foundational chart of where we are today and what's going on. And so what you see is that as those interest rates have gone down, and again, interest rates are the price that banks sell money, the amount of money that banks are making on the loan portfolio has been declining on a relative basis. It's been declining basically ever since the early 1990s. So that means that banks have got to figure out like, okay, our revenue is declining in this particular, in this important part of our business. So we've got to figure out some other way to rationalize this. So we're still producing decent profitability. So you have that thing. So as all this stuff is happening, that kicks off this deregulatory fervor because like, you know, people in Congress, policymakers saying, look, we need to help banks like be able to perform, even though it's getting tougher for them to perform. So what do they do? They deregulate the industry. And most importantly, they allow banks to start buying banks in other states across interstate lines. And they allow banks to start opening up branches. Well, when those deregulatory changes happened, you have a, an incredible spike in the number of mergers and acquisitions in the industry. And you can see that right here. Follow that spike all the way through to the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. And you have these three big banks who acquire roughly you know, they accumulate roughly 10% of the market share of domestic deposits. And that's important because then above that limit, they can no longer buy other banks. So they have to look for growth elsewhere. And so where are they going to look for growth? They're going to look for growth organically and specifically through technology. And so the reason that is a matter is because everybody talks about technology as if it's this end in itself and fintech this and fintech that. But the reason that the banking industry is going this direction isn't because of technology per se. It's because it's, make, it's harder to make money now because interest rates have come down to 0% ever since the early 1980s. So they got to be more efficient. Technology is a great place to find efficiency. And they've got, the second thing is that they've got, they still have to grow 
but there are so so many fewer banks in the country nowadays because there have been so many acquisitions that they've got to grow in some other way. And again, technology provides that way to grow without doing acquisitions. So just one last, let me just leave you all with one last thought. So uh, Kerry Killinger was the C chairman and CEO of Washington Mutual, which again was the biggest bank failure in US history as a bank that was based up in Seattle. And I was up, he wrote a book recently with his wife, Linda, and it was kind of explaining why it failed and trying to like, you know, not take responsibility in, in effect. And his point is that, look, Washington Mutual was inappropriately seized. And he says, the reason it is inappropriately seized is because we had reduced our mortgage originations, you know, for, you know, since 2003. So we saw the risk coming in and, and we responded to that risk. You know, other banks didn't respond to it to the same extent. But the problem was that, yeah, they decreased their loan origination volume, but what loans they had on their books changed from these safer conventional mortgages that about two thirds of their bank portfolio in 2003, of their loan portfolio in 2003 consisted of those to fast forward 2008 and about three quarters of their loan portfolio were then these other kind of random mortgages like pick a pay, option arms, that kind of stuff that were much, much riskier. And so the data is just so clear why they have failed, why shareholders and investors and depositors were so worried about their failure because of this is what was in their loan portfolio. But Kerry just couldn't, he just couldn't get that through his head. He just couldn't accept responsibility for that. He blamed it on Sheila Bear, he blamed it on Hank Paulson, he blamed it on Jamie Dimon, he blamed it on everybody but himself. And what you learn is that, again, to go back to the very beginning, like if you take your fiduciary duties seriously, that's the best way that you can run an incredible organization, whether it's a nonprofit, whether it's a bank, whatever it is. And part of accept, taking your fiduciary duty seriously is accepting when you make mistakes. And there are consequences when you don't, when you don't accept that. And so that's kind, of, that's kind of the overarching point here. And so I'll just leave you with this quote from Warren Buffett. Banking is very good business if you don't do anything dumb. And really like that's kind of banking in a nutshell. So there you go. Oh, thank you, John. Uh, I feel like I learned a lot from from the last hour or so, uh, mostly terms that I'm going to use in dinner, dinner conversations to make me sound smarter. Um, but I, I do have a few questions that have come up through Jamboard and through through the chat. And so I want to uh, remind everybody, uh, we have a few minutes left, throw your questions in the chat, and uh, we'll, we'll see how many we can get through here today. But the first question that, that comes up is, I come from a nonprofit. I am probably going to have a meeting after this conference with someone who has never experienced a bank account, never. Uh, they keep their money in their car because that's where they're they, that's where they are the most often. So what is something that I as a novice to the banking industry should know as as we we ask the question of why is it important for for me to understand the gears of, of the banking and the financial institution world? as I work with people who are experiencing poverty or people who are un, un or underbanked. Okay. So I'm not talking to the consumer right now. I'm talking to you and the people watching this. Okay. So we are people that have a vested interest in this whole thing. Right. And this is why I would say it's important for how we talk about this, how I talk about it, how you talk about it, Ryan, how Jennifer talks about it, how Adam talks about it, how Morgan talks about it. Banking traditionally has always been kind of looked at as this kind of predatory industry. And like to a certain extent, there is truth to that, but that is a very small group of banks in the United States. These are these big Lehman Brothers, that type, where they're doing proprietary trading and stuff like that, where you're moving in the market and you're doing like, there's really, the ethics there are much more lax than they, than they are in banking. Banks, as a general rule, these are institutions, you go into any small town in this country and you look at the main intersection and you look at, okay, you look at to the right and your left, like what are the main buildings right there at that intersection? It's banks. And the reason it's banks is because credit is the fuel. And this is like a cliche, but it's true. Credit is the fuel that drives economies. And so if a lot of people look at banks and they don't trust banks, a lot of people look at banks and they don't like banks, but that is a narrative that is false. Bankers are there. You look at any United Way uh, board. You look at any goodwill industries board in a, on a regional basis. You look at any of these, who's raising the money for the hospitals, for the capital drives. 
It's bankers. Bankers, they, they are critical to all of their economies. If you can get over and you can explain to people, banks are not bad guys. They are genuinely here to help you accumulate wealth. And so maybe you don't have to like work your entire life. If you can get people over that psychological barrier, you will be doing them a service. Because even if a bank is mismanaged, the FDIC will still come in and save your money. Right. I like that. It's it's a narr- it's a way of shifting the narrative of, of making sure that uh, we and, and the people that we serve see banks as customer service machines, not money making evil people. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, another question that came up and I want to read, make sure I read this correctly. How can we leverage fintech and, and or just interacting with uh, financial institutions through technology to increase financial inclusion? and wellness for p- individuals and communities who have historically been marginalized and excluded. FinTech is, a, is an important part of the equation. And the reason it's an important p- part of the equation isn't because technology is all sudden new and banks are like, oh my God, there's a computer. What is that? You know what I mean? Like, but let's buy some of those. It's important because it drives down the cost basis of running an institution. When you drive down the cost basis of running an institution, you don't have to run the institution by say, you know, increasing the overdraft fees and doing stuff. It is an alternative to that kind of stuff, right? To stuff on the revenue side of your, on the revenue part of your, of your, of your income statement. So that's where kind of the FinTech comes in. The other thing that comes in is it allows you, so there's like the Greenwood Bank. This is like a bank that started by a guy by the name of like Killer Mike and all these amazing people down in Atlanta that serves the, the, the black community and the, the Latin community in like wherever you, you live. What that does, it allows you to create a niche in an industry, whether you want to like serve a specific customer base across the whole country. You couldn't do that before. FinTech allows you to do it because you can, it doesn't matter where you are. If you got a phone and you got a computer, you can use those services. And the second thing is that, um, you know, it just, it just drives down the cost. So you don't, it's not, it makes it even less predatory than I think that, that, that people typically assume as already. Wonderful. Thank you. The, the, the ability to access it from any, any place is, is really important, especially uh, in, a, in a county like Skagit where, I, where I'm at is a, is a little bit rural and there are f- uh, fewer options to, to get into it, a physical space. Uh, John, thank you. I'm sure that there are more questions. So in the meantime, uh, if folks at home have more questions, please check out his, his published works and uh, please keep, keep the thoughts coming and, and ask yourself, how do we use this to move forward in my world. Thank you, John. Uh, Jared and Becky, I think, are, are Jared is up next. Thank you very much. Jared, you are muted. So I just wanted to let you know that. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'll say that all again. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank you, John, for that great presentation. Um, I thought it was really interesting to look at the nuts and bolts of banking, the history. Um, and while it was a little wheezy, I think it helps us understand kind of the context in which they operate, their purpose, and so on. So I think that's really helpful perspective. And just a couple of nuggets there that I grabbed onto. I thought your quote about, I don't know if that was Warren Buffett, about not unnecessarily interrupting the compound interest process is really something that I think when we're working with folks to think about when they're saving a little bit at a time, letting that compound interest do its thing, and it will grow over time and really be helpful. I think that's a really good takeaway for um, a lot of folks here that are working, that are kind of um, client facing. and also that credit is the fuel that drives economic growth. And that is, I mean, yeah. So that's really important to communicate to the folks that we're working with. So great presentation and thank you so much, John. Um, I'm gonna hand us off here to a video from Columbia Bank who sponsored this segment. My name is Efren Fasa, CEO and founder of Blue Buddha Coffee. My name's Ron Schinke. I'm with Town & Country Roofing. I'm Bob Oates. I'm the owner of Bob Oates Sewer Rooter. Through Columbia Bank's Pass It On project. Columbia Bank is providing the funds to pay for us to provide a service to a family in need that has been affected by COVID-19. It's part of being part of the community. I'm so excited. Columbia Bank is paying the bill. And we're passing it on. 
To see more stories, visit PassItOnProject.com. Wow, that seems uh, pretty exciting. Actually, I need to check that out and see what that's all about, the PassItOn.com through Columbia Bank. Um, okay, I think we are heading to break, and so we'll be back in uh, 10 minutes, so about 1127, and we're going to hear from Dr. Cy Richardson uh, from the National Urban League. So I look forward to seeing you all here in about 10 minutes, and here comes the music.
All right, welcome back everybody. Um, you know, I was thinking during uh, the break about one of the participants, one of the things that they shared today, that the financial institutions want people to be successful too. And I think John's presentation really highlighted that. So the question then kind of moves to how do we connect with people who are and who feel shut out of the financial institutions or the you know mainstream financial sector? How can we make it more welcoming um, to marginalized, low-income people everywhere? And I don't necessarily have the answer for that, but it is some food for thought as we get ready to hear from our next speaker today. Jared? Yeah, thank you, Becky. Our next speaker is Dr. Cy Richardson. He's the Senior Vice President at the National Urban League and a member of the League's uh, executive leadership team. Cy is a recognized and respected expert on housing and community development, job creation, and racial wealth equity. He's a sought after thought leader on issues related to building a more inclusive economy. Central to his work is the promotion of asset building and intergenerational wealth creation opportunities for people of color in urban America. In his current role, he leads the league's program design, implementation, and evaluation activities, supporting national efforts to create economic and social opportunities and ensure that prosperity is widely shared, regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, or geography. As a grants officer, he, has support, he supports efforts to increase economic security and mobility for low-income families, and close the racial wealth gap and advance financial inclusions. Thank you, Dr. Richardson, for joining us today. <clears throat> Thanks very much for having me, Jared and Becky and, and everyone else. I do appreciate that. Um, joining you from New York, the sun is out, but it's a bit chilly today. Um, just took off my sweater um, and ready to go. Um, very pleased and proud um, to be with you today from Wall Street, um, figuratively and literally um, today. Um, just a bit about uh, me before we um, get into um, my talk. Um, again, Cy Richardson, I'm with the National Urban League here in New York for 19 years. Um, I've and um, the, the main thing I just want to convey is that, you know, the Urban League is um, an institution, an American institution um, that, um, you know, has been at times um, kind of shunted to the corner, to the side and trotted out when we have um, kind of faced and been confronted with um, George Floyd, um, Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, Breonna Taylor, these kind of highly visible um, flare-ups, these highly visible um, tragedies and the kind of unrest and, and kind of action that follows, the Urban League is at the heart and center of that work, that understanding, that reconciliation. Um, that kind of narrative building. Um, but again, not just to be trotted out immediately before or after tragedy. The Urban League is in communities, has been in communities for 111 years. And as, as they say, we are a ship at sea that never reaches port. Um, we are doing our work 247365. And what I'm going to discuss with you today is a little bit of a, a glimpse into our view, our stance, our perch as it relates to narrowing the racial wealth gap. Um, my talk today is um, entitled Banking in Color, um, and it really kind of crystallizes and elevates the experiences of communities of color, households of color, their balance sheets, their insecurities and desires to enter and sustain themselves in the economic and social mainstream. Um, and the Urban League kind of endeavors every day to do that through our 90 affiliates, um, across the country in 36 states and District of Columbia. Um, and that is kind of how we're structured and how we work. Just a bit about the agenda. Um, I will begin talking a bit more about the Urban League and its relationship to the affiliates. I will talk a bit about the contours of the racial wealth gap as we understand it and have been kind of endeavoring to, to, to arrest its, its progress. Um, we will talk about the impact of the pandemic on black families um, and businesses, which has been in the news in an above the fold way over the last two years. We'll talk about the, the focus of me and my team, our work, which is on economics, economic empowerment, um, financial inclusion and opportunity. We'll also talk about the emerging field and subfields of behavioral economics. And this is where we have gotten to know a number of excellent fintech actors. Um, and we have struck a number of partnerships that we'd like to talk about the benefits and challenges um, that we've encountered. We'll talk about a fledgling collaborative 
Um, it was fledgling at one point. Now it has sustained itself over a decade, the asset building policy network. And I'll talk about kind of what we've accomplished, what we've achieved, and what are some of the lingering and emerging controversies from the field through the eyes and ears of our affiliates, as I mentioned. Um, I'll, I'll talk about um, a concluding statement and our reflections on this broader topic, where we can go next. And then I'll open myself up for, for questions, comments, um, and, and a dialogue if, if we have time for that. Thanks. Thanks very much. Again, very, very um, excited and happy to be here with you. So just a bit about the League. Um, the League is an historic civil rights, mainline civil rights organization. But again, we are programmers. We are community builders, community developers, in many cases, reflecting the communities where we reside and where we serve. But again, only you know 77 percent of the National Urban League's clients identify as um, native-born Black, African-American. We are a place-based movement administering our programs in a kind of demand response framework and rubric. Uh, our affiliate in, in San Diego and Phoenix serves um, Latino constituencies, uh, and proudly so. Our affiliate in Seattle serves the full pastiche and full spectrum of, of ethnicities and um, that reside in, in that wonderful city. And I'll speak a bit more about them later. Um, in New York here, our constituencies are mainly Latinx and African-American, but there's an emerging immigrant kind of cohort and coalition that's emerging. As, as is the demographic shifts occur in the country, the Urban League will be there to respond and to provide services to those at opportunity and in crisis free of charge. Now, that might be seen as a very 20th century outdated business model, but again, we are committed to serving people where they are um, within the kind of rhythm and structure on how they, you know, kind of um, receive information and help, getting them to a place of vulnerability where they can self-improve and self-reflect. Um, and I think we're doing that all within a hyper kind of competitive era where we have new actors, Johnny Come Lately, Deep Pockets, um, and that is something that gets my man up, um, but it's something that, you know, we are here every day competing, putting our own views and ideas in the arena and defending them. Taking some blows to the chin, yes, but getting up off the canvas. Um, what I do want to just kind of, you know, um, follow, follow on a little bit about is kind of um, our partnerships. So the Urban League of Metropolitan Seattle, and I'm kind of representing their interests here as well in a statewide way, led by Michelle Merriweather, the tenacious and cultured CEO of, of that affiliate, um, a visionary, um, and has really brought that affiliate as a kind of nonprofit business um, from the brink um, to a place of impact and influence uh, in a very kind of uh, tough city to serve. Um, she is aided by Linda Taylor, who I think is a, a member of your event planning team, a good colleague and friend of mine. Um, I often call her the mayor of Seattle, and she reminds me, she says, no, no, I'm from, I'm from Portland, which I think I received that the same way I tell people I'm from Brooklyn. It's designed to kind of develop a little bit of a street credibility. But again, I'll never forget that Linda is from Portland, yet resides and serves the city of Seattle. Won't forget that. Um, the, the next thing I just want to kind of talk about um, for a minute is how we are kind of endeavoring really to get in the fight uh, and, um, and in the game. And the racial wealth gap is the alpha and the omega of, of our work. And, you know, it, it never stops. And we are looking to kind of arrest its progress. From our perspective, the, the economic life chances of black America and white America are running away at light speeds. We can't have this. And it's kind of on our watch and our duty to arrest that progress and to kind of double down on those principles, practices, and policies that work to kind of arrest the racial wealth gap, slow it, and then kind of reimagine an economy for all. Clearly, though, by the middle of the 21st century, the United States will be a majority-minority nation. And if we hope to ensure a strong middle class, historically the backbone of the national economy, then the financial health of households of color will become even more urgent than it is today. Closing the persistence wealth divide between white households and households of color, which is already a matter, from my point of view, a matter of, of social justice, but it must become a priority for broader economic policy. The size of that wealth divide, as I've already been talking about, is sobering, mind-boggling. And as we consider what it's going to take to close the racial wealth gap, it is useful to understand and acknowledge the different vectors that fuel this landscape. 
here on this slide, um, I've just tried to kind of, you know, connote the notion of dynamism, inter, in, kind of intersectionality. And these gears, you may not be able to kind of make out the wording within them, but I'll just uh, summarize them. You know, in the middle is obviously equity as the kind of fulcrum, but opportunity, education, home ownership, income, small business formation, and unemployment are some of the things that are tearing at the fabric of our ability to move forward, as, as I say. Um, the racial wealth gap animates our work. Um, these are the three vectors that we kind of look at. The home ownership rates, unacceptable. I think the home ownership rate for Black America in 1968 was the same 42%. I know it's not, you know, a, a linear a progression, but the, the two steps forward, two steps back is not sustainable. So I, I think, you know, in a way, we have to reimagine how we build our allies and how we kind of narrate the kind of journey for the for communities of color and their balance sheets um, through what will be a, a, a period fraught with, uh, you know, finger pointing, recriminations, um, uh, tribalism. All of the backstory happening in the country right now is, to me, a sideshow to the real kind of, you know, main course, which is how do we ensure folks can enter and sustain themselves in the economic and social mainstream? So just a bit about kind of what the Urban League has been up to since um, the, the pandemic. And again, everyone has, you know, been in tune and understands the, the disparate impact and disproportionality of, of the crisis and pandemic on communities of color. Um, the, you know, in 2020, nearly 50% of unemployed white households could not come up with $400 in an emergency, while, you know, nearly two thirds of unemployed black households lack access to that very same $400. Black households are almost three times as likely as white households to borrow from a family member and friends to pay for expenses. And with that borrowing comes the kind of social capital formation, which um, kind of rages in the black community for good and not so good. But again, in many cases, we're talking about folks going for advice, for help, for assistance from folks who similarly don't know what they don't know. And that's something that we have to attack head on as we talk about how to serve different communities in a culturally appropriate and sensitive way. So what's been the, the National Urban League's community development response you know, since the pandemic? The main thing um, is that we've really tried to kind of inject measurement and also kind of heightening the awareness around the different kind of boosts and blocks to narrowing the racial wealth gap. We kind of use the terminology empowerment goals. And again, these were, were, were refined and set in 2020. Um, and they were kind of, you know, part and parcel of our um, organizational strategic plan. For housing, it suggests that every American, I'm sorry, for housing, it demands that every American lives in safe, decent, affordable, and energy efficient housing on fair terms. In the workforce development space, it demands every American has access to jobs with a living wage and good benefits. And in the small business formation space and entrepreneurship, which again exists in abundance in the, in the black community, you know, we really want to make sure that apps, access to capital and credit um, in a way that's responsible um, and kind of formative um, is, is very important as we look at the ownership society and making sure we have a place at that uh, very high table. So just a sense of the kind of geographic distribution on where we operate. You see the Urban League of Metropolitan Seattle there up in the far left. And again, we are, to be honest, a bit light in what we kind of term the Western region. And it's kind of demographic shifts and internal migration, folks are on the move in many ways in this, in, in you know, like a second great migration. I am concerned personally, my organization is, that the Urban League kind of, you know, lacks possibly enough delivery outlets to, um, of its kind of viewpoint, brand and stance um, as we do um, in, the, in the Northeast and the central part of the country. But again, our affiliates in the West are kind of punching above their weight. We have an incredible affiliate. I'd hold up against any others um, in Seattle and, and, the, and, the, um, um, and, and the, the Northwest. Incredible affiliate um, in, in Portland, incredible affiliate in, in Los Angeles, San Diego, Phoenix as well. And again, because of the demographics, they are serving in place folks who are there. And, and, and the demographic distribution looks a lot different in Phoenix and Tucson as, as it does in New York, Hartford and Baltimore, for example. 
This, this um, graphic, again, demonstrates where our workforce development operations exist um, with the kind of Rust Belt leading the decline of manufacturing, economic restructuring. We're looking at, you know, every mill town, every um, factory in the Midwest at one point in the 20th century had an urban league. It, it, it kind of served and functioned as a way to integrate and assimilate folks moving from the south to the north to find them work, housing, and education for their kids. Slowly, as, as I say, we've kind of, you know, kind of shifted and restructured our economy. Those you know, plants have closed. Those towns have kind of fallen off the vine in many ways. It's, it's tragic. The Urban League, too, has suffered. We've had to consider you know, how to kind of sustain our business model. And in some cases, we've been able to do that. And in many cases, we haven't. Right now, we have 90 affiliates. 19 years ago, when I joined the Urban League, we had 119. So you see that kind of um, you know, decline, in some cases, part of a broader organized abandonment strategy to kind of follow people where they are. We've opened new affiliates in Las Vegas. We've opened new affiliates in the Bay Area in, Cal in, in California um, and in, in South Florida. So we are responding with our finger on the pulse of where our folks are and they're on the move. We release a, a, a collection of essays every year called the, the State of Black America. Um, it is the state of Black America, the, the, the um, official record of the kind of policy practices, programs um, that are working. And again, critiquing those that are falling short and suboptimally working. And again, it is, it is um, accompanied by um, what's called the Equality Index, which is the, the measurement tool, which we are able to annually measure the economic opportunities and life chances of Black America, um, juxtaposed and compared to our Latin brothers and sisters, and white America as well. It is a um, provocative research project, applied research project, that we use and undergirds our, our research and our federal um, contracting. It really makes the argument that um, um, you know, Black America is suffering under the yoke, and we need to, in a kind of um, equity kind of um, design, really bring the spotlight um, to, their, um, to their plight. Final map I'll show is just, again, the, the geographic distribution of our small business assistance centers, our entrepreneurship centers. There's a dozen of them across the country, and they work to provide counseling, coaching, and again, doing the blocking and tackling to ensure there's access to contracts, capital, and credit for folks who, in many cases, who are starting a business, you know, a, a T-shirt business from the trunk of their car, you know, applying for loans on the back of their own FICO score. That kind of, you know, it's difficult to distinguish between someone as a small business proprietor and someone just as a citizen. And I think we need to do a better job, and I'll talk about that a bit later, of understanding the needs of emerging entrepreneurs and what the, the ecosystem and landscape needs to do to serve them more, more equitably and optimally. So just a, you know, a few quick facts about um, the league. Um, again, since the last great unpleasantness, 2009-10, we've been busy and on the move. This is just an exemplar an illustration as to some of the, the, the progress, the outputs and outcomes that we've been able to achieve. Um, no small scale here. We can do more, but we are doing our part. There is no monopoly on understanding how to reach, serve um, and you know, responsibly serve um, households at, at crisis or in crisis or at opportunity. We are doing our part. And again, there's no monopoly on that. We just have a, a very, you know, long tried and true model for, again, reaching people, narrating what that relationship will be, getting people to a place of responsible vulnerability and helping them reimagine their lives, helping them, you know, rebuild their lives and move ahead, moving up the two or three ladders, uh, rungs on the ladder that everyone in this country should be afforded the opportunity to do. So one of those people that I had the chance to meet over the last couple of years um, is embodied in this success story. And again, you, folks talk about kind of intersectionality as the kind of, which is not a kind of new term, obviously, um, you know, harkening back to you know, Kimberly Crenshaw's um, academic work. But it has become in vogue again as we talk about the layering, the multitude and multiplicity of challenges and problems for community and communities and households of color. This young woman in Chicago um, was, was um, uh, living on the margins at her wit's end and was able to find from the Chicago Urban League support, help, and assistance in a wide array of areas. You can see here, she was able to you know, get rent assistance. She was able to buy food. She was also able to kind of situate her, her elderly father in, 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 into some care as well. The Urban League is a, is a multi-functional kind of um, organization. In many cases, 
competing against single purpose nonprofits. And again, that landscape has shifted ever so slightly, but significantly since um, the, the great unpleasantness that I, that I referenced. We have new actors uh, on the block, deep pocketed, um, well-funded, in many cases, not reflecting the communities where the challenge and action is. We have a little bit of a, what I call kind of FUBU mentality, for us, by us. We need to take this opportunity to build the, the individuals, the institutions, and the emerging leaders who will, again, reside cheek by jowl with their very same clients, but again, be leaders in a way that is not just a, the typical rah, rah, follow me form of leadership, but the leadership that is, you know, um, by example. The leadership is through service, and the leadership is through responsible case management and counseling. And again, this young woman in Chicago was able to make use of all of those skill sets. And and again, in a way that did not cost her a dime financially, and in many ways, hopefully, kind of undergirded and supported and grew, grew her ability um, to compete, but also grew her ability to self-reflect and get a better sense as to where she wants to go um, and get back on that track. And the, you know, the number of stories that can embody that kind of progress are legion with the Urban League. I just selected this young woman from Chicago because I think it is an, an, an example of broadly as to the multiple touch points within a household with an intergenerational household where the Urban League is active. So there's been an emerging area where some of my colleagues, Ayanna Forts and Silky Mistra, who work with me in New York, have gotten on my radar over the last couple of years, which is the notion of behavioral economics as an emerging area that can be informed and can inform the civil rights community, the affordable advocacy, housing advocacy community, as to how people um, enter into decision making, um, how people receive information, and how those institutions that serve um, these households and individuals can 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 really efficiently and effectively get people to a place to um, to self reflect um, and also to um, to move forward. Um, there is a um, um, an, an important influencer with this space. I've quoted here Dan Ariely, who says, and I'm quoting him. One of the big lessons from behavioral economics is that we make decisions as a function of the environment that we're in. One example of this might be, um, and this is not a, a kind of new convection, but the Urban League has been a part of the kind of Vitasite movement and, you know, allying financial coaching and counseling around tax time when the, the decision that we're trying to nudge folks towards um, really is additive in their lives in a real-time moment, in a real-time way, not something abstract and conceptual. The decision-making you know, has, um, the stakes are high. And so we're trying to kind of you know, embody the kind of behavioral economics moment to be able to kind of um, imbue our clients with the values and the ethos of kind of um, learning, saving, sharing, repeat. Um, and that's something that, you know, is at the heart of our coaching work, which I'll discuss a bit later. So from our perspective, what are the benefits of, of, of fintech? Now, for us, it, it, it's best understood when combined and allied with financial coaching, which for us is one of the major tendrils that emerge out of the, the broader housing counseling space. We've been a housing counseling agency. In fact, our um, um, very famous um, um, executive director, Whitney Young, um, actually helped design the original housing counseling program um, in the Johnson administration in 1968. Um, and we have been a partner of HUDs every year since then in serving and reaching um, native um, um, African-American households for the full suite of housing counseling services. But what has emerged out of that space has been financial coaching as a more, and again, I'm preaching to the choir here, obviously, but as a more kind of fine-tuned and nuanced way to kind of help folks create the environment where clients can thrive by providing these tools. So, so, so why do we do that? How do we do that? What we have found through, so, through many of our focus groups and some, some of the evaluation work from our own programming is that clients and counselors face a lack of time. If anyone's read the great book, Scarcity, you understand kind of the, the concept of you know, slack resources and time. It's far easier to log on to an app than review an action plan, we have heard. And so we've heard them and re kind of reimagined how we reach and serve people using technology. 
We've also understood that clients find it hard to save money. We all do that. We all find it hard to save money these days um, without, a, without a roadmap. So we've really been drawn and attracted to apps that can automate savings, reducing the pain involved. And that pain is psychological, emotional, and that can be kind of, you know, kind of transmitted in an intergenerational way. So we're trying to kind of stop that trauma as well. We also know now that budgets can be difficult to create and stick to. Some of the apps that have been most successful for our clients can be based are based on kind of automated updates, thus reducing the friction involved in creating one manually. And again, the, the, the outcome piece um, is profound. In our pilot, 92% of, 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 of savings um, um, were obtained directly through a group that we'll talk about called Isuzu. And it's easier to get data directly um, um, in this kind of way than during more traditional case-managed client follow-up. Thanks. Sorry, I'm just having a bit of trouble on my end with my slide advancement. There you go. Oh, one forward. Great. One more. Great. Sorry about that. Um, this um, uh, graphic is, is an illustration as to um, the partnerships that we've been able to, to strike um, as part of the, uh, the financial health network. And this kind of illustrates the toolkit that we have been able to kind of expose some of our clients in, the, in a focus group format um, to. I'd like to kind of point out two of these partners that we've really had a particular success with. One is Digit, which essentially, you know, kind of, you know, is, is, is a tool to help people save, you know, um, use it or lose it kind of savings. And that is kind of has applicability broadly in all of our lives, not just in theory, but in practice. And, and the other organization that I've really been fascinated with is called um, Isusu. And Isusu essentially is a kind of um, savings, you know, savings club and lending circle, which really kind of advances the principles that have been, again, this is a broad brush, but, but missing from the, the native born um, African American experience. We have, and what it does is mirror or try to kind of recreate the kind of mutuality, trust, um, reciprocity that is required for folks to participate in lending circles. Um, and, and that has been elusive. I'll use the term, you know, crabs in a barrel. And, and we all know that this kind of motif where folks, you know, are finding it difficult to em emerge from their ethnic cohort. This program kind of turns that on its end as a kind of supportive mechanism that really tries to recreate that trust that other communities have more organically developed the kind of lending circle model. And I think immigrant communities um, have, have mastered this and, and other communities as well. And the native, the native born black experience um, has, has by and large missed the ability to kind of save and, and share information and be vulnerable at a community level uh, in a way that's structured to benefit all emotionally, psychologically, but financially as well. And Isusu is, is a partnership that collectively our participants have been able to save hundreds of thousands of dollars that have been able to kind of parlay into um, um, many other asset building trajectories as well. So here's just a summary of it. I'd like to just go over this real quick if I might. So it, Isuzu, our FinTech pilot, focuses on savings and credit, which is a very important um, 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 tandem there. About a thousand clients participated in, in, in the pilot and lending circles and the solo savings options match up to $300 each. 12% of our participants became mortgage ready during a time where it's very difficult to do that. And on average, the credit scores of these participants increased by 63 points. There was a 12% rise in loan eligibility for our participants, and the platform enabled the Urban League itself to increase their total savings, the Urban League clients, that is, by over $300,000. And on average, clients saved more than $568. Then we think this is potentially game-changing if taken to scale. And again, with a, with a match savings component, uh, we think there is um, incredible promise here um, with this platform. But there are some challenges, and I'd like to talk about those now, just for a second, coming out of the, the our focus group work and also kind of culled from the, the client experience um, um, and, and feedback, you know, we need to ensure demand 
um, that our best and most proactive, most responsible um, fintech founders and actors are building their programs and building their platforms with the unbanked in mind, with credit invisibles in mind, with a way that we've learned this from our, from our colleagues at National Capacity and Unidos US, two excellent community development organizations that serve their, or that, that serve their respective communities as well as we do as, as community developers. The language barriers as well, not so much for the native um, black um, co community, but um, as I mentioned, for the Latinx and Asian communities and others, um, language accessibility and comfortability is important and our best actors in this space account for that. There are always con security concerns these days. Um, and I think that's something that even though it might be irrational folks and not understanding the different you know, ways in which they are protected, I don't think it's out of bounds to really give folks a place of comfort as it relates to you know, their new and emerging comfort with existing and building an identity that's digital in nature. We can't expect everyone to just organically and authentically come into that. And I think we have to really be intentional around kind of making people comfortable um, and, and, and setting the, 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 the landscape such that folks can, can um, compete equitably. There are data limits, obviously, um, for, for folks who, who are um, existing and, and experiencing these tools and their time constraints as well. We've learned all about this in, in the, the thousand participant um, focus group that we were able to um, deliver the last several years. So the thing, one of the things today that some of our um, clients and colleagues are talking about is kind of bias, subjective and otherwise, um, in all of our systems building um, and institutional, um, um, you know, kind of knowledge sharing. And again, I use this kind of little cheeky graphic to do two things. And again, I've, I've thought about this in more than one way. Um, you know, the, the picture of a doctor, you know, when you close your eyes and think about a doctor, perhaps many of us are thinking about the image on the left, uh, the, the white man in the white coat, smiling, of course, there he is. Um, but again, maybe communities of color are thinking about that differently. Um, in a kind of, you know, kind of like for like way. And, and there are other emerging communities that have similarly um, been confronted with the tension between kind of symbolic representation and substantive representation. And so me, me, me myself, um, I, I do believe, you know, I want the best health care I can get. Um, but, you know, I grew up with just having black doctors and some of my other colleagues, colleagues as well. And it's something that, you know, kind of what image first comes to mind, different communities when they close their eyes and think about um, the image, the reflection, that too can reflect where they're coming from, their bias. And again, that is kind of benign bias nonetheless. So in, in lending, this has become an emerging um, area to examine um, and an, emerg an emerging area um, to contend with. Um, and again, these are just kind of headlines, you know, cropped here um, for the benefit of the conversation. But again, you know, AI is not the solution, just as my colleagues you know, remind me here, technology in and of itself is not the, the solution necessarily. It has to be kind of understood and wrapped within a kind of systems you know, conversation and configuration to understand how best to optimally build, optimally narrate, optimally outreach and optimally serve um, existing new and emerging constituencies. And we think, you know, in within this context, um, and I'll talk about credit scoring here for a minute, because credit scoring is one area that has emerged as a major um, avenue of conversation and debate within these focus groups at the affiliate level. I don't think, and I could be wrong, and I hope I'm not misspeaking, but I don't think most of us, um, regardless of color, ethnicity, history, where we're from, understands the, the centrality, the, the oversized importance of that kind of thought bubble and number that, that follows us around every day of our lives, everywhere we go in the form of a, of a, of a credit score. You know, um, people talk about, you know, kind of, you know, risk-based pricing, you know, as the kind of system du jour. There are many kind of inadequacies um, in, in the kind of risk-based pricing framework where credit scoring is the, the initial or at least an intermediate kind of wedge that kind of gets the racial wealth gap going and, and kind of works against the work of our organization and others to kind of slow down that speed. We have to understand what are the pressure points? What are the dials? What are the levers for consumers to improve themselves? 
decision making, yes, but also those actors who are building products and kind of offering offering them to um, consumers who look who are looking to build their own digital identities. This is very important that there is deep kind of distrust um, for historic reasons in these processes as we learn more about them. And also the, the current prevailing kind of credit scoring model, you know, doesn't fully reflect the different ways that people exist or does so with disparate impact. You know, everyone has talked now about kind of non-traditional indicators. The Urban League, for example, was an early adopter of the, wow, I'm dating myself here, but the pay rent bill credit model, which has emerged into kind of non-traditional credit, you know, act activations. But pay rent bill credit, it initially was something so singular and, and, and simple. But again, you have to build allyship, you know, you have to engage the landlords, you know, talking to, you know, kind of, you know, um, large institutional, large institutional um, landlords and, and, and owners. You know, this is, um, you know, easy to design, sometimes difficult um, to see through. But, I, but I'm arguing that the prevailing risk based pricing system with the classic FICO model is more harmful to minorities in part because of what it doesn't count. I think that's the main takeaway here. So, I mean, just a few points and observations um, from, from our perspective. Obviously, point one is kind of beyond obvious, but because it's beyond the obvious, I want it to be um, self-evident in many different ways. Machine learning is based on human input. And so we talk about kind of the subjective bias of the, the you know, the real estate appraiser. And, and that's an area that's taken up a lot of my time of late because it's been in the news lately. But we're also talking about kind of the algorithms that are built in an AI based framework to replace the, you know, the, the human, you know, uh, appraiser, you know, um, also is designed with, you know, the kind of subjectivity of the engineers who are building that system. I think we have to kind of take an expansive view as to kind of, you know, where the bias could uh, exist and if diversity and democratization of those spaces would make a difference. And I think we have to apply those standards to this emerging field as well, rather than just as the pendulum swings, just reactively, you know, pick, picking machine learning as the way to kind of remove bias and disparate impact from, from and noise from the machine, uh, rather than fully understanding how those systems in turn are built. And also, we need to apply, you know, a kind of diversity frame here. In other industries, they talk about, you know, diversity, you know, drives and achieves better outcomes. Well, what are the better outcomes here? We need to define those and be clear as to what those are in a measurable way. The data inputs are also important as well. Um, AI systems are only as good as the data we put into them, right? And bias and input data, gender, race, traditional credit scores, as I mentioned, create the foundation for discrimination. And in many ways, similarly to the kind of real estate appraisal conundrum that we're faced with now, that's you know, layered over years and generations. It's not any one individual putting their finger, putting their finger um, um, you know, on, 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 on the, the, the scale or you know, some kind of bad kind of you know, Trumpian actor in the corner, you know, kind of wringing his fingers in some kind of you know, doc, Dr. No, evil James Bond kind of way. No, it's kind of layered and passed generation to the next generation. And there's no one singular block, but collectively, in tandem, this system possibly is not working for all of us. And so I, I think before we, the pendulum swings fully back to machine um, learning and, and machine-based decision-making, I think we need to understand all of the, the different opportunities and nuances that exist, particularly, and I will just say this at, at this point, um, you know, a full-on move from what we have today, which is, you know, um, an appraisal industry. And again, I'm talking about the kind of in a housing space, the real estate appraisal industry. That is, in many ways, that does not reflect, um, you know, the, the demographic, demographics of this country. Is still dominated by uh, you know, older um, white males um, as a vestige of how that industry kind of grew and emerged and exploded. Um, well, I think we also need to excuse me, you know, understand um, how do we kind of democratize these spaces as a workforce development set of activ activities? I'm just fearful that a quick and hurried move to machine learning and technology to replace you know, the human decision making re removes from the Urban League, for example, and other organizations, the ability to create pathways um, and emerging areas for um, vocational um, and, you know, um, um, job-based opportunities for seekers who want to move into these into these um, professions. Um, we think that 
a quick move to um, technology to replace that removes from us the workforce development opportunities that are intrinsic to every um, aspect, nook and cranny of civil society. This, um, um, this one um, not, not um, excluded. And so we are pumping the brakes a bit on the full rush to, 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 to um, AI decision making um, because we first need to understand its implications that I mentioned the existence of bias in that framework, but also what are the workforce development pathways and, 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 and where's the potential for, for groups that have historically prepared people for work, the jobs for tomorrow um, that may exist here. And we want to kind of be provocative to talk about what are some of those opportunities as well. One of the, one of the proudest moments of my, of my professional life um, came about a decade ago when, you know, at, at the height of our kind of crisis and, you know, that moment was, was, was fraught uh, for all of us, um, organizations coming together with shared interest, that takes maturity. That takes a certain degree of um, uh, emotional intelligence, you know, for, for the leaders of these organizations that compete against one another. A whole city aside for a second, but national capacity, the leadership conference, policy link, the Urban League, UNIDOS, Prosperity Now and NALCAP are, are some of this, this nation's preeminent and impactful and influential, you know, nonprofit community developers, some with a more kind of traditional social service model, but some really on the cutting edge of providing, you know, technical assistance and the type of products, loan products and otherwise, that are um, targeted in a laser-like way, in a way that um, um, it, folks do not feel ashamed and um, around it being kind of racially based. This is the kind of laser-like response and relief we need. These organizations are the kind of progenitor of those and also the, the carrier of those. And so during this time, we had the chance, the CEOs of all these organizations had the chance to, you know, you know go big and compete against each other and be the last man standing. That would have been the kind of, um, you know, traditional response, scorched earth. Rather, what we did was sit back, convene by city community development, which was the real thinking partner here initially, um, and say, could we reimagine a space in which we work together? We now know that our constituents are living cheek by jowl in dense urban places. We know that we're serving each other's constituents by definition. What if we came together um, and, and tried to do something as a collective um, that would benefit um, multiple communities um, within an ethos of shared racial fate. So we got together, formed the Asset Building Policy Network, really catalyzed by city community development. They do deserve credit here. And again, this was supposed to be a one-off where we agreed to hunt for funding and we agreed to develop um, policy stances that held the line. We were in a you know per perpetual defensive crouch during this period. A lot of folks lost you know more than their mortgages. Many lost their lives and many lost the, you know, the will to, to, to fight. And so what we agreed to do was bring spotlight to that archetype, resisting the tribalism, which kind of, you know, the country is kind of up to its neck in now. But, you know, there's no monopoly on serving people in crisis. And that was the kind of, you know, formative idea that brought the, the Asset Building Policy Network together as a one-off to get through those very tough tenuous years after the, 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 the Great Recession. And, you know, I'm so proud to say that we've learned a lot. We have learned a lot and we've, we've achieved a lot. And this collaborative still exists. It ex exists in a muscular way. It exists in a way that is modeling for other, the way in which other financial institutions understand their partnerships and how other financial institutions, you know, subscribe to the notion of what my college baseball coach used to say, it's incredible and amazing what could be accomplished when no one cares who gets the credit. Now, again, you know, it's, e it's easy to say um, it rolls off the tongue easily and simply, but, but think about the value inherent in such a statement. At, at, you know, at, at the early stages, we agreed that there's, again, no monopoly. We have to team together, and that's what we've done. The main thing that we've done is, you know, take our kind of roadshow on the road. We've, we've activated our affiliate networks. All of us have affiliate networks in place, serving people um, in communities. And so what we did was we de developed a number of kind of community forums, racial and economic reconciliation meetings um, where, where our affiliates, you know, got together, brought in their communities and talked about what they've seen, what they've experienced and where they're going and how this collaborative can help them get there. 
And so there's this, you know, the main thing coming out of um, ABPN was or is um, a, a reliance on, on the infographic platform to not only tell people what we're doing and what they're experiencing, but to show them in ways that allow them to digest it from a place of vulnerability so they can raise their hand and say, yes, I want that. Or explain to me how I get from here to there. And this kind of middle section that we're kind of, I'm trying to kind of graphically de describe here is kind of what is our organizing principle. We believe that to foster an economy that benefits us all, everyone, everyone must be able to build assets and contribute. And addressing the racial wealth gap is a crucial first step. And as I launched into my talk, I said that is the alpha and the omega of the Urban League's understanding and our work. And so the ABPN is really helping us to contribute at this very important juncture where we have to replace many aspects um, of the systems that have, you know, let many of us down, let many communities down. You know, part of, you know, the ownership society, you know, does not apply to everyone equally in this country. And so part of what ABPN is endeavoring is to, one, narrate what's gone wrong, learn historically about how public policy um, has, has gotten this way and allowed it to happen, catalyze further private policy, which has really put some communities under the thumb. And how can we start that slow emergence, re-emergence in ways that can really build upon the, the racial economic equity conversations and financial inclusion conversations that are um, dominating, the, dominating our um, community development world today? So um, I'm going to kind of run through this. Um, I think there's a link possibly um, um, to this doc document, um, this bit of research that we um, worked on years ago in, in, in collaboration with other members of the ABPN. We have, again, and this presentation is, is, is called Banking Your Color, bringing perspective, bring, bringing the kind of um, presence of communities of color to a place at the table where they can you know, transact, exist um, on fair terms. And so, you know, some of the methodologies are here uh, and what it sought to do was kind of, you know, develop a survey instrument that really got to the heart of, excuse me, how communities are feel and how they are kind of precariously positioned economically and what to do about that. Some of the major themes, um, cus cus you know, customer service and location matter, right? Account fees and minimum balance requirements are also driving choices um, to, to how folks take up um, their banking products within the mainstream. Now, we know there are others chipping away at the mainstream, the check cashing and payday industry, but we're trying to situate folks within the mainstream. We believe we, we've learned that there's a widespread access to and use of the Internet and smartphones, although we also know that there's a differential. We, we know that African-Americans disproportionately and over index in cell phone, mobile phone usage. Yes, we know that. But as I mentioned earlier, kind of risk based pricing has, has kind of reduced some of those cell phones to, you know, the basic kind of jitterbug phone that my 87 year old dad has. Right. I mean, if you're if you have a crappy credit score and, and you're, you know, kind of, um, you know, buying your phone or kind of coming into a, a plan that's based upon bytes or bits and you don't want to kind of take a picture of your check and upload it because that's too costly to you. So understanding the nuance to how people use these devices and the different ways in which they come upon them uh, for, emerged out of this research. Some of the key recommendations, we think we need to increase bank account ownership, obviously among the underserved within a mainstream context, expand financial capability for the underserved, leverage technology, which we're talking about here. We really need to increase small dollar lending in a responsible way as a backstop um, against kind of these actors like water finding its way through cracks in cement, you know, these unscrupulous and actors will find, you know, tomorrow's, you know, clients um, and are doing a much better job of outreach and, and narration than many of us. And so that's something uh, to, to be um, warned against as well. And so the, the, the second component part to this research, um, the first being the um, banking in color, the second called the future of banking, really uh, is, is a, a follow up to that first report. And the core finding here is being disconnected, not just dislocated, but broadly disconnected from mainstream financial services carries major costs for LMI consumers. And this can be quantified, but also the notion, the qualitative sense of being on the outside, of, of being outside of the mainstream. And, and folks who feel that way, you know, predominantly in communities of color, households of color, it's not sustainable, can't have it. And that's something that this publication really brought light to. Finally, I'll talk about just the focus of, 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 of ABPN. And it's something that I really encourage uh, folks to, to look in a bit more. 
really, you know, the problem is navigating the banking world. It is complicated, yes. So we need to really create a network of, of financial navigators the same way that, you know, um, in, in after the Affordable Care Act, you know, healthcare navigators, you know, hand holders, um, you know, places of responsible information for folks who are un un uncomfortable in a like for like way. We believe similarly this needs to exist in the financial services space. We also think for consumers who cannot afford to bank with mainstream financial institutions due to high fees and minimum ba balance requirements, we need to update business models to monetize client success. Increase language access, as I mentioned earlier, and accept alternate identification. Um, these are things that have really been influenced by our colleague in, by Unidos US, and we've learned a lot from them in the process. Finally, you know, how do people of color, they're excluded from the consumer credit and banking systems. And that's something you know, that is, is not sustainable and we cannot have as well. Um, so I think that coming out of this conference and, and other kind of fo community forums should be a major focus of research um, and conversation as we look to kind of bring people and sustain them into the mainstream. Next slide. Thank you. So um, I will I will end here. Just give me one minute. I'm I've I've kind of want to kind of try out just a a, a bit of a a text that I'm, I'll be delivering um, next week at a talk, and then I'll be concluded. So low and moderate income people continue to face significant barriers to banking with financial main, um, with mainstream financial institutions, including identification requirements, the high cost of services, language requirements, language barriers, credit requirements, checking account reporting, and fewer bank branches at LMI communities. Although fintech holds promise, LMI consumers will still face obstacles to full financial inclusion if reforms, incentives, and careful regulations are not put in place. Federal consumer protections are waning as high cost affordable financial services remain problematic at wide scale. A comprehensive review and set of reforms are needed to ensure LMI communities will be able to access safe, affordable and productive financial services and products that empower them to enter the economic mainstream. There's ample room for innovation to ensure that everyone has access to affordable short term credit, retail banking and savings for future events like retirement and children's education. Careful collaborations among financial institutions, fintechs, and government can lead to financial inclusion and success for those who are currently underbanked. As financial services, fintech policy and regulation continue to evolve in response to a changing economy, it is essential to continuously focus on the goal of financial inclusion for all. For all. A more equitable economy is possible if LMI consumers of color and others who have historically been excluded are ensured meaningful access to safe and productive financial services that help consumers participate, prosper, and reach their full potential. The viewpoints and stances that I've just outlined represent only a segment of concerns that were shared by LMI consumers and experts through, through our work. Government, philanthropy, banks, and fintechs need to hear your community voices. Local efforts, state advocates, and national movements are essential to inform and reshape how the financial services industry interacts with the most vulnerable populations. A financial economy that works for the 63 million unbanked and underbanked will also work for the 96 million living in or near poverty, and thus for the nation. The nation needs the 63 million unbanked and underbanked as contributors as the mainstream financial economy and enhancing their financial inclusion will directly impact the nation's economic growth. It will support the emerging majority's ability to afford stable housing, build wealth, and to save for the future. The implications cannot be ignored. The future of the nation's economy is dependent on how low-income communities and communities of color are able to advance up the financial and economic, and economic ladder. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Sai. That was a wow, a lot to unpack there. Really, really great, uh, really uh, great presentation. Um, a lot of folks lighting up our jam board with questions. Um, where to start? Um, let's see. Someone, one of our uh, attendees asks <laughs> if you have a crystal ball and have a timeline for um, where you see the future going in terms of the reduction of the race, race um, wealth gap. Um, if you see any major progress being made, some promising trends, anything like that. I've, I've got to be honest, I am extremely, I'm extremely bearish on this, Adam. I, I'm Jared, I, I really think that, um, you know, even though it's been kind of, you know, kind of subsumed within the kind of broader kind of, you know, 
you know, disconnect in Washington. I fear that this infrastructure conversation, this build back better conversation, you know, at, at, the, at the critical juncture, all of the component parts that fuel what I've talked about here will be jettisoned because we lack the kind of natural collaborations and allyship to, to get it over the line. So unfortunately, I think we are, we'll be wandering the desert for a few more years um, and decades possibly, but I do think we are in the right direction. Our North Star is set. And the key is now to kind of expand the scope of folks who feel they that they have a fight in this conversation and this fight. Yeah, that's brings that, that's that's something I noted too. Is this is all very um, a lot of interesting things you presented and in, in, in the kind of the the elephant in the room um, to, to a large extent I think is partnerships, right? And how do we you know you had at several different places of this network of navigators really leveraging existing knowledge in the community, but also leaning on people's experience. So what, do you, what does this look like to you to help, what does the community level work look like? Well, the community that, that level work- move the needle on this. Yeah, the community level work I think is embodied in some of the successes from the ABPN, as I mentioned. At that time, we could have retreated to our own corners and competed for our share of the cases. The commodity in our space is the case. So you can build for the case. And I think we decided to reject that kind of methodology. And again, share, pool our resources, pool our knowledge. And also, you know, all of us have, you know, um, uh, you know, have benefactors in, in Washington um, in our state capitals. Let those folks meet each other share, to see where we have a shared interest. And again, crystallize around shared racial fate. We talk about it nationally, but it's activated locally. And I think rebuilding that trust between and betwixt communities is the first baby step to take towards, you know, fixing the country and the economy for us all. Okay, I and mean, what do you? I don't, I don't know if you have a, a view on this, but what do you think that looks like for like the the, the front customer facing person yeah. at a nonprofit that wants yeah. to move this work forward? What yeah. are, how are they collaborating with their peers and other organizations? Yeah. What yeah. Does it look, I don't know if you have a sense of what feeling of what this looks like on that level. Well, let me let me just say this, and I'm speaking directly to the frontline um, service providers. I honor you. I celebrate you. Um, in many ways, you know, I, I'm the guy behind the guy behind the guy. I'm sending you know, resources to the front lines, financial and otherwise. But again, you're living it every day. And these are difficult conversations. You can live and die, you know, on, you know, emotionally on, on the outcome of some of your clients. I get that. It's a different world. Um, what I need to do a better job of is listening to what resources and tools are needed. And in return, not just send them, but help to kind of crystallize and contextualize. The scale is a massive. You're talking about individuals, but then groups of households, groups of people. Um, and then there's kind of the regional kind of, you know, you know, di differences and variations. I would say you're not alone. And I know we know this, but I'm just kind of reinforcing it. But I think there may be different ways to reimagine who's on our team. In fact, I would argue everyone on this webinar, everyone on this event, even though we're all wearing different jerseys, by virtue of us wanting to know more, learn more, and hear and hear more, we're, we're all working for the same team for the same goals. And in that sense, we'll all win. But again, this may be more than a nine in a game. Okay, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> people really, really have confidence in you. Uh, so um, let's see, some very... Uh, well, I'm sweating. Questions. I'm sweating here. So yeah. large questions. Um, all right. I'll throw this one out there for you. Uh, does the Urban League believe reparations should be a part of an effort to close these enormous gaps? And where I'll kind of offer a little my perspective is that I don't know what the questioner doesn't indicate, but this doesn't necessarily have to be direct financial compensation. Right. right? There's other methods of reparation. So, um, yeah. It's what, a great what's question. Your, what's your take on that? It's a great question. I, I welcome that question. I welcome it in my personal life and my mm -hmm. professional life. So the answer is um, yes, but with a caveat. So yes, our, our worldview, we you know, um, have, have read the history. We understand you know, you know, what's come to pass, the, the kind of interrelation between public policy and private policy and how that's worked um, for certain communities and against others. Um, but again, reparations is both um, a notion, an ethos, a value system, but it is kind of a, a, a framework and a rubric. And so our view would be um, that we need to have kind of racially specific public policies that really can affect and move the dial. For example, I'm a national co-chair of what's called the Black Homeownership Collaborative. 
And what we've tried to do is push, stand up a campaign called Three for 30, which is trying to create 3 million net new black homeowners by 2030, net new. Understand that we're going to lose some folks. But again, we in our plan, and I, and I can send this around, the link to our, our, our plan, it is a set of seven recommendations that deal with the kind of statutory, regulatory, legislative opportunities that we have available to us to kind of really lift up some communities in a way that um, kind of really gives fire to, to President Biden's commitment to equity. Now, one of the main areas I'll mention that really can be um, seen as, as, a, as a kind of reparations-like initiative is around down payment assistance. We know that the gap between who has, who has access to DPA and, and those who don't have an, a large, you know, power in explaining who ultimately becomes a homeowner and what kind of products and when, et cetera. We think a down payment assistance program targeted towards first time minority home buyers um, would move the dial now. And that's something that we're pushing now, working with Maxine Waters, Senator Sherrod Brown. Um, now we think we're close. We have this in the, uh, the infrastructure bill, housing as infrastructure. And we think that would also, the home builders are on. So again, I can send around the link to that seven point plan, but three by 30 is a, rep, a reparations kind of initiative that brings a spotlight and resources and attention of thinkers to how we can kind of lift up some communities while not kind of letting others sink. But again, that's equity. <clears throat> Very good, interesting. Um, let's see here. Uh, da, da, da. I'm, I'm interested in what you have to say around um, uh, access to credit and capital and entrepreneurship yeah. and help and, and as part of the one of the pieces to this puzzle and especially places where there's like banking deserts like yeah. how is technology going to help us here? You talked about yeah. some of the some of the pitfalls of technology yeah. with bias in AI and machine learning. So well, where do you see the tools well, in place, specifically places that are underserved and might even be yeah. banking deserts? Let me, let me riff on that for a minute, because in many cases, we've looked at some of those same banking deserts are food deserts. They're also, you know, kind of, um, you know, Wi-Fi deserts. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of infrastructure um, has, has, has abandoned or left behind um, some of these um communities at the neighborhood and census tract level. And so it kind of, there's a layering, they talk about in, you know, kind of intersectionality, but there's a layering of challenges for, for these places where you um, have a, um, a long way to travel to bank in a brick and mortar uh, store. You have um, a long way to go to find um, you know, a fresh and, and, and kind of uh, food that, yeah, that's that nutritionally you know, kind of significant for your family and kid. You have a long way to go um, to, to f find an internet provider um, that can do so affordably and reliably for you. And so, you know, as you seek out these, you know, in diff different, you know, s community supports, you probably pass three check cashers and five payday lenders as you're trying to find your, you know, your Bank of America branch or your city or your Chase or your Wells branch. That's by design. It's a different business model that in many cases reacts and moves in just as, you know, kind of the mainstream financial services sector, you know, reimagines how it exists, which is based upon technologies in many ways. So it's self-reinforcing, but it also is, you know, actualizes a widening of the racial wealth gap. Because as one of the things we heard in our, in our survey work, it is access and ease. And again, the check cashing and payday folks have mastered that. You go into a check cashing place. It's like a McDonald's. Price is clearly aligned, very clear as to what you get. You know, you you don't you don't have time to go somewhere to remit back. You know, to, to Mexico or or your family somewhere else. You can do that there. You can check. You can pay. You know, pay pay your bills. You, you the notion of one stop shop um, can be perfected by by mainstream actors. And that's something I think we have to double down on. Access to credit and capital. I think we just need someone to stand up. You know, one of our big financial services firms, and say, look, you know, we really want to, you know, get give the HVAC contract to a, to a firm of color. Let's see how we can, you know, um, you know, you know, create partnerships where, we, where where that can happen. Um, I really think we need to have someone to be extraordinary in this case. And as I, and I've witnessed many cases, the extraordinary idea, folks follow behind that. Okay. Um, let's see. How about the partnership between financial institutions and community-based organizations? Where where can they work together more effectively, in your eyes, 
to around specifically this area of this racial wealth divide yeah. and developing opportunity for marginalized communities? Yeah. Well, one thing um, they need to do is, is understand the arc of, of recent history, as I've tried to lay out, inadequately so, but I've tried to lay out where we've come over the last decade. Um, and I mentioned new actors emerging. So I'll say this. Um, what the nonprofit still needs is the bank to buy, you know, a, a two tables at, at its fundraising dinner. We still need that kind of philanthropy. OK, this is not this is not that's a false choice to say, how would you like it? We still need that. But we also need facilities that are additive and help nonprofits compete, not just exist and, and, and com but compete in a way that's resilient. So, for example, you know, um, you know, we have 90 affiliates, Jared, and about a dozen of them also operate as um, nonprofit housing um, developers. They're doing kind of acquisition and rehab, you know, kind of single site stick fill, um, stick built infill housing. Um, they are competing. They're non, they're, they're affordable housing developers. What they're telling us and what I know to be true are, are they, the Black Rocks of the world are coming with deep pockets, um, buying up properties, which really kind of put, puts a plug in the kind of, uh, you know, mortgage ready home ownership kind of continuum. You can't compete with that. So what I what you know I think Bank of America has put itself out there to wanting to be helpful, standing up a facility that nonprofit right. community builders and developers can tap into to be able to acquire those properties, to be able to bring them back into commerce and connect them with a mortgage ready client and household. But if you don't have the ability to compete financially, all these ideas are like a tree falling in the woods. No one hears that, man. You know, so I think we need the ability to compete, and in many cases, it, it is based upon the largesse of some of our, of our financial services firms. And I do think that can be transformational, helping brick and mortar nonprofits compete again, block by block, in these edge neighborhoods. We are seeing gentrification accelerate because we do not have a presence to be able to hold the line. To hold the line, and you hold the line by you know kind of observing patterns you know of, of, of ownership and you know kind of being able to raise your hand and say this is an important project for the life cycle of this community and b of a wells chase city um we need your support and again some of our um, more open-minded banking partners are moving on this very thing but i do think um to be able to compete in a way that is not just you know performative but really competing you need access to capital to be in the game and that's what some of our frontline nonprofits need now now. Thank you for that. Um, last question I'll, I'll put out to you. Um, you, you, uh, you, you, you highlighted a quote in your presentation around behavioral economics. Um, yes. You said one of the big lessons from behavioral economics is that we make decisions as a function of the environment yes. that we're in, yes. which I don't think enough people appreciate that, yes. that statement. Um, sometimes myself as a practitioner, coaching individuals, um, working with low-income individuals around access to education, housing, all the things you're talking about, I find myself a little bit stuck because we, you talked also alongside that, I think you said FUBU, um, for us for bias. bias, yeah. Uh, so you have like a kind of this, they're not at loggerheads, but it's just like you have an expert, hopefully, and then you have the person with the lived experience. And how do you reconcile those things in a behavioral economics way that you're kind of, you know, helping guide them and giving them the information, the resources they need um, to make those things because they might not know what they don't know what they don't know and they don't know the practices that exactly. are really beneficial to them. So what 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 what's your any any uh, closing um, remarks or perspective on that? It's a great point. Um, um, we're conflicted with this tension as well. Um, again, the flip side of that coin is meeting people where they are and, and all of that connotes. Um, I do think, um, for example, the kind of brand trust that my organization carries allows people to be vulnerable enough to hear that they don't know what they don't know. That's a first important pre-step um, to, 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 to progress, um, while recognizing the, le the legitimacy of their experiences and, and, and the legitimacy of, of, of the, of the mistakes they've made, um, and the legitimacy of all of the, you know, part of our coaching work in many cases is also classroom based because you're teaching folks how public policy affects and interacts with their decisions. Um, and it kind of builds us kind of civic engagement dimension as well, which 
is the level and plane that all of us should be operating on today. But no one's, there's no right or wrong answer to, to it. But the, no, the, the simple example of using tax time as the critical moment, the critical moment to talk about savings and its trans, transformational potential at a time when folks may come into a, you know, a, a, a little bit of um, cash um, and pointing to others, doing this as a collective and having it recur I think that's how you build, you know, kind of decision making that's at, at a societal level. And then you could activate a turn on the social capital, you know, to say, did you go down to your Vita site? I was there today. Did you go? The same thing we're trying to turn on with kind of vax and anti vax. You know, use social capital, trusted voices, the navigator model to kind of put people who have something responsible to say next to people who are yearning and, 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 and just dying to advance in life. That kind of combination can create better outcomes. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, thank you, Sai. Really, your, your enthusiasm is really contagious and lots of great information there and really admire all the work you guys are doing over there. Um, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks very much. And thanks very much um, for asking me um, to participate um, on behalf of the Urban League. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll turn it over, turn it over to um, Ryan and Becky to uh, close us out for the day. Well, uh, thank you. That was just absolutely incredible, I, all I can say. And I'm, I'm super excited. I'm so glad that this is recorded because there were so many things that I wanted to write down and take notes on that I, you know, I, I, I couldn't because, you know, it was quick. <laughs> um, I did. I tried to do a couple screenshots. Anyway, it was absolutely amazing. And, you know, I'm excited by about it. And I'm excited about looking at it on the national level. I'm excited about it because we have our own Urban League, you know, here in Seattle as well, um, who I'm fortunate enough to be able to work with on a, a few different projects, mostly housing related. But, you know, I, I think it's really exciting. Um, so I just want to you know, I, I know he's off the call here, but I just want to say thank you uh, to Dr. Richardson today for such an incredible presentation. Um, and again, thank our sponsor, uh, Wells Fargo, um, for the, today's sponsor, the innovator sponsor. Um, and, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan to close us out. Thanks, Becky. Uh, I definitely echo all of our thanks for, for all of our speakers today. Um, and I think that this is a great energy to leave with. I'm excited to see what day two brings us. And over the next, uh, however, the next day, this next afternoon, evening, uh, I encourage you to take a moment to reflect on what your experience has been today, what you've picked up, what questions you still have, uh, take a little bit of time. I know that everyone's busy, but take a little bit of time to, to sit with the information that we've talked about today and see what your next steps are you specifically uh, on how we can bring around greater uh, financial well-being for our communities and our partners. Uh, there will be a survey going around in the chat uh, shortly. I do encourage everybody to give, give uh, your feedback. Uh, it helps us build a, a program that is, is what you guys want to listen to. So with that, from all of us here at Bank on Washington and all of our affiliates and all of our partners, thank you, sincerely thank you for joining us for this morning of day one of the Bank on Washington forum. Looking forward to hearing about uh, your reflections and your thoughts. Check out the Jamboard for everything that we talked about today, any new discussion pieces, and uh, make sure that you are ready and caffeinated tomorrow morning because we're diving right back in. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day, everybody. Bye.